Good evening, Tinku Ma'am and everyone. I'm Dr. Hello, Dayan. good evening, Garima. Yeah. Ma'am, my video is not working, so I'll say sorry for that. It's not working for Zoom app, actually. So it's That's okay. okay. My slides will be real life. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, good good evening, friends, and welcome to this seventh webinar from the uh, team ARC AIOS. Today we are going to have a, a webinar on posterior segment challenges for the anterior segment surgeons. I'm uh, Dr. Tinku Bali, who is our member ARC North, is going to be the moderator in main. I would be just complimenting to some extent with her. I I, I take this opportunity to thank our expert panel, Dr. Raja, Dr. Sai Kumar, Dr. Arul Mazi Verman, and Dr. Vinay sir for agreeing and consenting to be a part of our uh, this particular webinar, as well as all the speakers whom subsequently Dr. Tinku Bali is going to uh, introduce one by one. Uh, and Dr. Tinku, Dr. Anand Pangarkar sir is senior, amongst the senior most person. As we don't have Dr. Arul Mazi Verman, we can have him as a chairperson, as an expert panel for the whole of the session. Hmm? Okay. So, Thank you. Oh, Welcome, sir. Yeah. You can go ahead. Okay. So, uh, as you know, this webinar is uh, on the posterior segment challenges for the anterior segment surgeons. And we do hope that this webinar will give a middle ground where both anterior and posterior segment surgeons can come together and reach a consensus on the common clinical conundrums and challenges that face us all. So, we'll be dealing with conditions that are complications of cataract surgery and also conditions that go hand in hand with a cataract, uh, you know, and which a cataract surgeon should be wary of and should take into consideration when doing surgeries. And we also will be telling you some innovative uh, posterior segment techniques that can be used by anterior segment surgeons. So with this, I welcome our faculty, our chairpersons, the moderators, the speakers, and all the participants who have logged in, all, uh, all the audience. Uh, to start with, I would like to introduce the chairpersons. We have with us Dr. Raja Narayan, who is a very prolific uh, retina surgeon. He's the Network Director of Human Resources and Director Anand Bajaj Retina Institute, and also Director of the Suvain Clinical Research Center. He's also adjunct professor of ophthalmology at the Uni University of Rochester, New Delhi. So Dr. Raja Narayan from LB Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, we welcome you. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Sai Kumar. He's again a very expert, a very senior cataract and glaucoma surgeon. He's the medical superintendent and head of cataract and glaucoma services at the Giridhar Eye Institute, Kochi. And uh, he will be here to give us his inputs on how he manages cases of cataract when he has posterior segment uh, issues. Um, we have uh, Dr. Vinay Garodia, who's the founder director of Synergy Eye Care in New Delhi. Uh, not only is he a very proficient and a very expert vitreo retinal surgeon, but he's also a very, very adept cataract surgeon. So I think he would be the right person to give us perspectives on both sides of the coin and, you know, give us uh, very good tips on how to manage posterior segment challenges. Um, we have Dr. Anand Pangarkar with us, who uh, is one of very senior uh, retina surgeons. And we welcome him and uh, thank him for having to agree to chair the session with us. We also have a very stellar panel of moderators for the debates that we have at the subsequent, uh, you know, subsequently after the talks. So we have Dr. Ramandeep Singh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, Dr. Manish Tandon, Dr. K.P. Kudlu, and Dr. Harban Slal, who is the president of the AIOS. So uh, before, uh, uh, without much ado, now I would invite our first speaker, Dr. Thirumalesh MB. Uh, Dr. Thirumalesh is a translational scientist and a vitro retina consultant at the Narayan Netralay in Bangalore. And uh, he would be talking to us about cataract surgery in a diabetic patient. So over to you, Dr. Thirumalesh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tinku. And uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant and ARC for this opportunity. I hope uh, you guys can see my slides. Yeah. Mm. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Sorry, out of touch with Zoom. So, uh, so my topic is uh, cataract surgery in diabetic patients and uh, cataract surgery in diabetic patients usually uh, pose a few unique challenges. A few of them may be diabetes related. A few of them might be related to the posterior segment issues like retinopathy, which may progress and, you know, go on to the next level. So the common uh, diabetic related problems that, uh, you know, one might encounter is a poorly dilating pupil. Uh, cataracts in diabetic tend to be a little hard. The classical leathery ones are usually described in uh, diabetic patients. There can be epithelial defects that can happen because the stem cells of the limbal epithelium are not in a very good condition. There can be endothelial concerns, so one should always look into the endothelium before planning. There is a little higher risk of endophthalmitis whenever we do cataract surgery in diabetics. That is because the ocular microflora tend to be a little different. Retinopathy related, you can have rapid progression of DR. There can be incidence or worsening of edema, and there can be risk of neovascularization, which tend to progress you know, very rapidly if not looked into. So what are the indicators of poor visual outcome following cataract surgery in diabetics? Uh, so way behind uh, in one of the reports of the ETDRS, they published that whenever there is presence of diabetic macular edema, which previously was called a CSDME, and if somebody goes ahead with a cataract surgery, the patient might end up with worse uh, than 20 by 200 in the long run, despite an uncomplicated FECO emulsification. So one should bear in mind that if there is DME, please treat DME first. The second important prognostic factor is that if you have a, you know, the severity of DR at the time of cataract surgery is a very important factor. If the severity is more, make sure that the control is good enough and, you know, you kind of look into the severity and have the discussion with your patient. If the patient has more severe condition like <clears throat> treatment IUPDR and the patient, you are doing a cataract surgery, one can expect vitreous hemorrhage and progression of that DR very fast. There can be anti-segment neovascularizations as well. If the patient has dense hemorrhage, you know, consider a combined surgery where you can kind of clear off two pathologies and also take care of these issues. I'm sorry. So uh, here is a sample patient. You know, this patient had come for cataract surgery. We saw that there was severity of DR. So we did a fluorescein. This was not only to understand the disease, but to also show the patient that there inside there is extensive leakage. So this also tells the surgeon. So much of blood retinal barrier there. Although there is no DME currently, uneventful cataract is because there is no blood retinal. After cataract surgery, which is a relative stress to the eye, it can increase inflammatory cytokines and angiogenic factors, uh, which can cause DME and progression of the disease. Now, when is doing a cataract surgery less risky or when would what kind of DR doesn't progress is that if you have a patient who is who's having mild NPDR, moderate NPDR without CSME, you know, these are your low risk patients. But if you have a patient who has a more, who's having a moderate NPDR, but CSME is already there, this patient would, you know, as indicated, would end up with poorer vision. If the patient has severe NPDR, make sure that, you know, uh, until and unless you have controlled it well, or that is the last option, don't progress with cataract surgery directly. If you are doing cataract surgery, then make sure you, uh, also kind of look into the uh, blood retinal breakdown. Few few authors now uh, kind of uh, do give a DEX implant when they are uh, kind of operating a severe NPDR. If there is DME, treat DME very promptly and then do the cataract surgery. If there is a proliferative disease, it's always important you take care of the proliferative disease by doing a laser and probably doing a surgery after about six months if you know it allows you. Certain preoperative consideration with reference to the patient per se is that, you know, diabetic patients can end up with intraocular infections very soon. So make sure that there is no periocular infection. There is no blepharitis, no, you know, any style, something like that. One should also, you know, uh, be reminded of that the ocular flora is a little different. Staphylococcus aureus, enterococci, certain kind of streptococci and uh, Klebsiella species are more prevalent in diabetic patients compared to non-diabetic patients. A comprehensive uh, examination of the anterior segment for looking for an NVI on the non-dilated people is very important. Do a PRP whenever there is a proliferative disease. A combined surgery whenever there is a TRD. So DME should be adequately treated. If there is any kind of maculopathy, explain to the patient that, you know, after cataract surgery, there can be development of DME and you need to be very, very careful with the follow-up. And also uh, you have to aggressively treat the DME once you do a cataract surgery and you get a manifested DME. 
recently the studies have shown that you know if you use nsa the the pupillary dilatation can be a little better and uh, these patients tend to have slightly lesser dme but then it is open to discussion whenever there is neovascularization of the iris it definitely requires prompt treatment either before the surgery if it allows or immediately after cataract surgery intraoperative uh, uh, consideration make sure that you know whenever we are doing a cataract surgery the rexis size is 5.5 uh, and make sure that you choose a larger diameter IOL where you have a 6 mm IOL. Diabetic patients are more prone to keratoepitheliopathy, so you know, uh, take care of that. Specular microscopy is also very important. Longer duration and complicated surgery can cause progression, so make sure that those due consideration are taken into effect. And diabetic patients will have poor dilated pupils, so make sure you have these hooks and rings uh, along with you. But also note that they do not have any kind of NVI because uh, these can cause uh, high FEMA in the post-operative period if you use and also during intraoperative period. Intraocular choice, uh, now uh, they can develop PCOs more common because of the high level of phosphorus that is there in the uh, aqueous of these patients. Make sure that hydrophobic acrylic lakes are the choice because uh, they tend to have lesser propensity of silicon oil if need be at some point of time. Use of multiple accommodative oils in diabetics remains controversial. It's always better to avoid if you can, if you already have diabetic retinopathy in patients and reduce contrast sensitivity in multifocals can also get aggravated if you if the patient has any kind of maculopathy. Iris claw lenses are usually avoided. Post-operative consideration, make sure that you, if you are not able to grade the retinopathy, make sure that immediately after cataract surgery, you look into the level of diabetic retinopathy in these patients. And uh, especially the ones with proliferative, it's extremely important that they be taken up for laser or, you know, probably given intravitreal uh, anti vegf injection during the surgery itself, and then call them up for early laser. Uh, corneal edema and endothelial problems are one other thing that one should be on the lookout for. And other anterior segment complications like severe iritis, portsis, and are again more commonly reported in patients with diabetes. So they have a risk of post-operative end-off, so make sure that you keep them on close follow-up, which is very, very important. In case of PDR, why I'm stressing this is because it's very important that many cases who did not have PDR or who had a small rent, you know, they tend to uh, end up with NVI. So it's very, very important that you look into these cases. If there is any DME, treat DME aggressively. If they develop, uh, if you have not lasered before immediately after cataract surgery, make, make sure that you can take it up as early as two weeks. Post-operative, uh, you know, as early as possible. Intra-intra-intraoperative anti vegf If you have diabetic uh, DME, or even for the cases where you have PDR, giving an anti vegf injection during the surgery itself might help. In summary, make sure that you have done a very good uh, uh, comprehensive examination with reference to level of retinopathy, how the ep uh, epithelium of the cornea is, how is the endothelium of the cornea, what is the level of retinopathy, is there a DME? You know, all these things should be considered. A slight early when the patient has good control of diabetes, if you do a cataract surgery, you know, that might be beneficial with reference to, you know, keeping up with the retinopathy and examining the patient becomes easier. Diabetic patients usually uh, have these significant problems that I uh, kind of uh, mentioned. So here is a, a patient who came to us. He already has an NVI, you can see. And uh, we planned a cataract surgery. Uh, this was a combined surgery that I had planned because the patient also had a TRD uh, in the back. You can see that the pupil is not very well dilating. I did put a little uh, adrenaline to this patient. And what I uh, did in this particular patient was that, you know, I kind of uh, followed the rexis, which was about five millimeters and uh, made sure that I did a good rexis, which was about five, 5.5. And uh, in this, despite uh, poor dilatation, although I did not uh, actually need any uh, dilating device, but uh, you know, you should remember that if there is an NVI, it's very difficult to use any kind of pupillary expansive devices. And if you're using it, use it in the quadrants where uh, the neovascularization is not very uh, florid like in this particular case. So after that, uh, it's, you know, if you consider all this, then it becomes any kind of routine uh, cataract surgery. You can go ahead with your, uh, you know, either a primary chop or horizontal vertical, however you might, uh, you might prefer. And uh, once you have achieved that primary breakage, you can, you know, kind of uh, remove the nucleus and uh, do a good IA and place a foldable IOL. So I think the rest of it, I will not probably go ahead and show because uh, it, it's a talk for another day. Uh, so I hope that uh, during cataract surgery, we kind of uh, uh, look into all this and probably help our patients uh, get better vision. Thank you very much. Yeah.
thank you dr thirumalesh for the very comprehensive talk so uh, we have a few questions in the chat box uh, one question is that will the cataract surgery worsen the diabetic retinopathy i think your both the edema and the prol if it's a proliferative yes. disease so uh, if the patients have uh, worsen uh, anything more than moderate and also have a dme those patients will tend to develop more and more recurrent and non resolving kind of a dme if the patient has uh, a diabetic retinopathy it will have a tendency to become more and more worse like i showed in my slides if somebody has a severe npdr which is and you are taking up the patient with no with the poor control or not a good control they tend to progress very fast if you have uh, you know severe npdr they tend to become pdr very fast so it's very important to note the severity of retinopathy because even an uncomplicated cataract surgery can cause rapid progression in severe kind of retinopathy um Dr. Raja, any comments on this yeah. or anything that you'd like to add or share? Yeah, good, good presentation, good video actually. Uh, uh, the NVI which you mentioned, you know, uh, we need to be careful. Sometimes what you see on slit lamp may not be the full. Uh, you know, you may have more NVA also. So if if you have any NVI suspicion, I would prefer an intravitreal avastin. Anywhere you are doing a combined surgery. so that would be a better option just as an option for cataract surgeon i'm just telling that uh, that is one thing uh, but in terms of progression of dr definitely yes there should be no doubt uh, if we say that in some cases it may progress just communicate with the patient that after cataract surgery if you already have pre existing diabetic retinopathy uh, the chances are that it will progress compared to a non operated eye okay so from that perspective what you need to be careful about is uh, one if you already have a moderate npdr or severe npdr please always get an oct done preoperatively now we rarely operate nowadays mature cataract that you can't get an oct but you must get an oct preoperatively uh, in where whichever patients you are going to operate with diabetic retinopathy because the communication becomes better with the patient patient is not in for a surprise doctor doesn't need to uh, defend themselves after the cataract surgery if the outcome is not very good and if you uh, oct is normal go ahead with your cataract surgery but if the patient already has a pre existing diabetic retinopathy just tell them that you know i am referring you to a retina surgeon my cataract surgery has gone up well when the patient is doing very well that's the best time to tell the patient now you know next checkup you should have with the retina surgeon rather than patient developing a problem and then you telling referring the patient to retina surgeon that creates problems with the patient's expectation and understanding so these are my uh, few uh, suggestions can i ask uh, dr sai kumar sir you have two situations one is a treatable maculopathy with a cataract which you cannot treat through so uh, so how uh, what you how do you follow in your institute the protocol yeah uh, thank you so our protocol is to always uh, go ahead and give an anti vegf injection a few days prior to the to the cataract surgery especially if there is uh, some new vessels in the iris uh, i would prefer that the anti vegf is given at least 24 to 36 hours prior to the surgery and then uh, you know the patient is taken up for surgery if there are no new vessels uh what we do is we do the cataract surgery and along with that we we do give an anti vegf injection so that is the protocol that we follow and if the visibility is good and if there is a pdr sort of situation uh, probably we can uh, and and if it's especially if it's treatment naive then uh, you can go ahead and do uh, at least a scatter prp some amount of prp uh, before you take up for surgery and then once the view is better uh, finish the prp and then look at the uh, retina once again so a case where you have injected an anti vegf because of you couldn't treat the maculopathy because of cataract now after cataract surgery how many days later would you recommend a retina specialist opinion this is for general ophthalmologist i, I would expect dr pangarkar dr vinay garodia also to join this discussion so our protocol is that uh, i see the patient 5 uh, days after uh, the cataract surgery uh, and a week from that that checkup so that will be roughly about uh, 10 to 12 days from the cataract surgery uh, the the retina surgeon will have a look 
Uh, I would say that uh, for all the cataract surgeons, whenever a diabetic comes to you for a cataract surgery, that's a very good time to educate them about proper care of retina and teaching them about diabetic retinopathy because at that time, they're at the most uh, receptive self. So I think even if the patient doesn't have any diabetic retinopathy, please make it a point to educate the patient that he needs a regular checkup for diabetes retina and also to forewarn them that, yeah, in your case, there might be more chances of edema. So I think... Since we know most of the patients are not educated about diabetic retinopathy, so I think the anterior segment surgeons can start teaching them about diabetes and retina at that time. Everything else has been covered by the other panelists anyways. Okay. Now, if I can just reiterate uh, the, a very important point Dr. Garodia made. The patient, if once the patient develops a problem and then you refer, it's always taken as the surgeon's fault. Yeah. But if you tell beforehand, it's more like, oh, this doctor is taking care of me. He's planning for the future also and, you know, multi-specialty care. Over. So that's the way we should, we should not try to uh, do a procedure by suppressing information or facts, rather look at it in a holistic point of view. And this makes our life easy as a cataract surgeon. We don't have to be defensive answering the patient and their family later on. We all know how bad experience it can be. So just take care of the patient, communicate well. So Panga does both the things simultaneously. So how, how is his outlook towards such patients? I would say there are a promise and over deliver. So I think you should always tell them that, you know, there's a guarded prognosis. If everything is fine, you're good. Otherwise, you've already covered your base. So I think uh, yeah. same what uh, Dr. Raja is saying. Yeah, I think communication is the key in every diabetic patient before a surgery. They should be told about their condition. So uh, should we move on to the next talk? Because I think diabetes and cataract, the, the discussion is going to be endless. There's so many facets to be covered. So if we have time, we'll come back to this discussion later. And uh, we'll move on to the next talk, that is cataract with posterior uveitis, what to do. And uh, Dr. Abhilasha Bharani will be talking to us about this. She's a senior consultant and a uvea specialist at the New Retina Eye Care Institute in Hyderabad. So, Dr. Abhilasha, over to you. Till she uh, loads her presentation, Pangarkar, sir, you can make the last comment. Yeah, there are a few points I would like to make. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. There are a few points. He has mentioned about the risk factor being retinopathy. I will make a one blanket statement that there is one step worsening of the diabetic retinopathy, whether it is clinical macular edema, diabetic macular edema, or uh, NPDR going into PDR. So that one step worsening. Second thing is some patients present with a diabetic foot. We have to ensure that all those things related to diabetes are taken care of before he enters our theater. Third is the avoidance of certain drugs. And fourth thing is I have burnt few finger, uh, my fingers in a few cases where I injected uh, anti-VEGF along with the cataract surgery. In case you have any problem, then you can your chances of landing up with endophthalmitis are more in case you do a simultaneous injection. Thank you, sir. Thank Dr. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. I thank AIOS ARC team, Dr. Prashant and Dr. Tinkubali for this kind opportunity. Cataract is the most common surgical indication in uveitis, accounting for 40% visual loss and 1.2% of all cataract surgeries. About 60 to 80% eyes achieve a BCBA of better than 2040, but post op BCBA is one to two lines worse than non uveitic eyes. In this talk, I'll cover preoperative assessment and preparation, intraoperative challenges and techniques, and postoperative complications and management. When we see this picture, it's prudent to get an ultrasound done, not only to look for vitreous echoes, but also to look for choroidal thickness in case which will give us an idea of the inflammatory activity. Wherever fundus is visible, please assess the visual potential of the patient. Uh, look at the optic nerve. This is a case of multifocal choroiditis, which had uh, developed a subtle disc pallor after treatment. And in these cases, visual fields come very handy in uh, predicting the visual outcomes. 
Uh, in this is a case of intermediate uveitis. While we are busy looking at the snowballs, we, we might miss a glaucomatous disc. So please look at the optic nerve, get a field done. So you will be able to prepare the patient beforehand. Uh, wherever possible, check pupillary response and color perception. Uh, macula, look for macular scar. Wherever possible, please get an OCT done. Look for CME, ERM. You might even see a full thickness macular hole behind a dense vitritis. Uh, risk factors of post-op uh, hypotony. Uh, now, hypotony is more difficult to manage than IOP spikes. The indicators are intraocular pressure less than 6 millimeters of mercury, even when the eye is quiet, seclusio pupil with normal IOP. Uh, whenever you're in doubt, please get a UBM done. If there are cyclitic membranes, a vitrectomy has to be planned. Poorly controlled inflammation is also a risk factor for post-op hypotony. Timing of surgery is very important. The eye must be ideally quiescent for three months. Uh, if fundus is visible, I like to wait as long as possible for full control of inflammation. Early cataract surgery is preferable to assess and manage posterior segment pathology and when advanced cataracts pose greater surgical difficulties and risks. Counseling is the most important uh, part of the cataract surgery in these eyes. Patients should be given realistic expectations about their vision and they must be informed that the surgery might take longer than usual and there is possibility of delayed recovery. Uh, many patients think that after cataract surgery, they need not take their systemic uh, tablets. So compliance with uh, medication and frequent follow-up is key. Many of these patients are younger than 40 years. So before surgery, do not forget to tell them that they'll need reading glasses post-surgery. Uh, Preoperative preparation. Now, steroid prophylaxis is for those who are at risk of macular edema, recurrence, or post-op hypotony. I step up uh, immunosuppression one month prior to surgery. Oral steroid should be given one milligram per kg starting three days preoperatively and tapered to preoperative le levels at one month. Local steroids can be given only when you know the etiological diagnosis. So absolute and long lasting control of ocular and systemic inflammation is key uh, for satisfactory results. Uh, where there is propensity for infectious uveitis to uh, reactivate like toxoplasmosis and herpetic uveitis, prophylaxis should be given. Choice of surgery is phacoemulsification wherever possible. When there is coexistent glaucoma, cataract surgery should be done first uh, because if glaucoma is done first, subsequent cataract surgery might fail the glaucoma filtering surgery. Where there is coexistent retinal problems, combined surgery can be done. Uh, the type of anesthesia is surgeon's preference. I prefer subtenon anesthesia because it is less painful and easy to give with a 23-gauge single port cannula. You can see in this video, just enter the subtenon space and inject. Now I'll share uh, videos of two patients. Uh, yeah, Coming to intraoperative challenges and techniques, uh, so we all know that in these eyes, we are faced with small pupils, shallow AC, posterior sinaceae, peripheral anterior sinaceae. So I'll share videos of two pati uh, one patient where I have done uh, iris hooks for one eye and uh, BHEX ring for the other. Now this is the first eye surgery where I've used uh, iris hooks. We release the uh, posterior sinaceae. So I put the iris hooks in a diamond shaped uh, configuration. So iris hooks should be inserted and tightened sequentially. You need not make a long tunnel. So diamond uh, configuration, unlike square configuration, it's easy to do the surgery because there is no tenting of the iris. So the main incision is made above the plane of the iris hook and phacoemulsification is routine. The other important thing uh, is to remove the viscoelastic thoroughly from the bag because leftover viscoelastic can itself lead to post-op uh, inflammation.
So I go behind the eye well and remove the viscoelastic thoroughly from the bag. I'll show some complications of iris hooks. So here, this is a case of uh, intumescent cataract where the anterior capsule is ruptured and there is mushrooming of lens fluid. As I said, uh, when you have a square configuration, uh, the tented iris tends to get, uh, get damaged with uh, instruments. And here, the iris got damaged with the chopper. And throughout the surgery, there is bleeding from the iris. The surgery should be done uh, carefully and Be careful while removing the iris hooks. Here, a tag of the iris is pulled out while removing the iris hook. Coming to the second eye of the same patient, under subtenon block, uh, the posterior sinecae are released. Stretch pupilloplasty is essential when we are using BHEX ring. Inject viscoelastic in the anterior chamber as well as behind the iris. Now, BHEX ring is a device which has flanges with engaging holes and uh, the pupil is expanded to a size of 5.5 millimeter. It's pretty easy to use. Removal is also straightforward. Again, cleaning the viscoelastic thoroughly from the bag. Comparing uh, iris hooks and uh, BHEX ring, the pupil size is almost the sh same, but shape is better with uh, BHEX ring. There is a slightly le learning curve with BHEX ring. Uh, surgical maneuvers are easier with BHEX ring. Surgical time is shorter with BHEX ring. However, the po post-op pupil size is also smaller with the BHEX ring, but post-op astigmatism is comparable between the two. A question that is often asked uh, is whether or not to do a PI. So clear corneal phaco with a large continuous curvilinear capsulorexis without surgical PI is the preferred technique. However, in pediatric uveitic cataracts, PI helps. Now type of IOL. So acrylic IOL or herpen, uh, heparin surface uh, modified PMMA IOL uh, result in better visual outcomes and lower post-op complications than silicone or unmodified PMMA IOLs. Multifocals are best avoided in these cases. IOL or no IOL in pediatric eyes. So post-operative aphakia is associated with better long-term visual prognosis in young children who are younger than five years. However, um, heparin-coated IOLs in fully controlled inflammation for at least three months. IOL is not a formal contraindication. In one study, 80% eyes achieved a visual acuity of better than 6 by 9.5 when uveitis was quiet for at least six months prior to surgery, the common complications they noted were PCO, glaucoma, and CME. Coming to post-operative complications and management, uh, so post-op inflammation can be controlled with aggressive topical oral and periocular steroids plus topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Posterior sinecae and pupillary membranes can be prevented by keeping the pupil mobile. I use uh, homatropine twice a day for one week. So the principle is to over-treat and relax and not under-treat and then try to catch up with the inflammation. PCO and capsular phimosis are common post-op complications. These can be prevented with circular, large, well-centered caps capsulorexis. Hydrophobic acrylic IOL with square-edge optic design is better than hydrophilic IOLs. Uh, we should remove the uh, viscoelastic meticulously from the back, like I showed in the videos. And there should be good control of post-op inflammation. Post-op CME is the most important complication. So the incidence of CME in uveitic eyes with well-controlled inflammation for more than three months is comparable to non-uveitic eyes. The risk of CME is 6.7-fold higher in eyes with a history of previous CME. And CME is more common in Bechet's uveitis than other etiologies. And the mean period of uh, development is about seven months. And the risk can be reduced with post-operative non-steroidal drugs. So to summarize, etiological diagnosis of uveitis is key for well-controlled inflammation. The timing of the uh, surgery as well as counseling is important. Intraoperative challenges can be overcome by well-planned and meticulous surgery. 
post operative care includes management of complications thank you thank you dr abhilasha that was a wonderful talk uh, i would now uh, request the chairpersons uh, if they have any comments or questions and uh, we won't be taking any questions from the chat box as of now for for lack of time and we'll go ahead with the next talk just some quick comments dr raja dr vinay dr pangarkar sir dr sai kumar any comments any additions dr sai excellent. kumar yeah, excellent I'm... presentation yeah yeah very excellent. good presentation sorry sir carry on carry on sorry excellent presentation the only thing i would add is the use of uh, intraoperative epidrate do not for dilatation but it will control the iris bleeding which you can which you commonly see with this second is no matter what you do these people tend to develop a very thick eco and or pupillary membranes in the post op period maybe a year down the line so i feel i i advise them to use atropine at least once or twice a month otherwise excellent presentation thank you so i think we'll move on to the next talk now so next we have with us dr saurabh patwardhan he is the director of the nandadeep group of eye hospitals and pg institute he is also the head of the faco training and fellowship program and he runs an extremely popular faco training youtube channel so dr patwardhan will be talking to us about the management of pct a vitreo retinal perspective so yeah. over to you dr patwardhan thank you uh, thank you dr tinku bali and uh, thank you arc for uh, inviting me for this talk and i'll be basically uh, speaking about few tips about antivitrectomy uh, before uh, you know in my talk so let me begin i hope the screen is visible yes okay yes. so uh, i think one of the most important things for a cataract surgeon to understand is how to do a good antivitrectomy and uh, there are certain tips and tricks which will definitely help uh, all the anterior segment surgeons to know what to how to do so the primary aim of anterior vitrectomy is to cut and aspirate the prolapsed vitreous but without causing any vitreous traction that has to be understood so if there is a ruptured anterior hyoid and vitreous prolapse and vitreous is not removed and just pushed around this is commonly done and then the iol is placed maybe on table the iol is centered but what happens is that later there are high chance of posterior segment complication at the same time it will start prolapsing and decenter the eye and one first tip is always do a closed chamber antivitrectomy and nowadays i think doing manual vitrectomy is not at all required because we have such good instrumentation the, the days of manual vitrectomy are absolutely gone so we should avoid that one of the most important tip is to always suture the incision before we start antivitrectomy and always make adequate incision size for uh, pushing in your you know vitrectomy probe because sometimes we push in your probe through small incision and that may lead to desmet detachment very occasionally we can use the main incision for antivitrectomy that is sometimes for ease of access for example patient has deep set eyes or uh, prominent nose but make sure even while doing that that the anterior chamber is well maintained that means you have to uh, you know tent up the anterior lip of the incision even when you are using the main incision for doing antivitrectomy second how to choose the right settings you have to use the highest cut rate which is available bottle height should be lower to 60 cm and vacuum 150 to 250 vacuum should be enough just to cut the vitreous and should not be so much that the anterior chamber is collapsing always use the cut eye mode for the vitreous now uh, the uh, next important tip is that uh, while starting the vitreotomy you should always start in the area of pcr and always look for the certain signs signs of presence of vitreous now one of the mistake done is irrigation probe is directed towards this area of the rent that what it does is that it hydrates the vitreous more and more and more vitreous will start prolapsing so avoid doing that it's better to use the uh, irrigation cannula which we use in ia bimanual ia always notice the peaking of rent and the capsular margin these are the important subtle signs of presence of vitreous many times we 
might be staining the vitreous but these kind of strands may not be stained and you can look at the peaking of the capsular margins and that will give you a fair idea where the vitreous is going and usually it is under the incision so sweeping under the incision while doing anti-vitrectomy is very important that will take care of all the vitreous strands which have gone into the incision if we leave that there will be peaking next day and there is a chance of vitreous weak syndrome causing uh, persistent CME in these patients so always look at all the incision and sweep under these incisions so that there is no vitreous strand left before you close. Always use diluted triamcinolone. So what I have seen is that many times we use undiluted triamcinolone and the triamcinolone may directly go into the vitreous cavity so much that it might lead to uh, persistent raised IOP later on. So in this uh, case, I am showing just how to remove those vitreous strands which are there. So uh, the uh, again to just uh, you know uh, uh, emphasize, you can see the piece uh, the anterior margin here. Uh, if there is tenting up of this margin, that means there is vitreous present. So you need not always uh, need a IVTA to check for the vitreous. These subtle signs are quite useful to know that the antivitrectomy is complete. Also, pupillary margin when you put maybe myocol or pupil constricts while doing antivitrectomy. Watch for this contour of the pupil. If there is any notch seen, you, you can see that the vitreous strand is there and you can remove it by cutting. Again, sweeping under the incision, as I said, is a very essential before we end up. Even after putting aisle, you can see that before I end, I am just checking under the incision to look for any vitreous strand which is trapped. Again, I am just uh, showing that after uh, many times after doing the vitrectomy and aisle insertion, if we put myocal or pilocarpine, it, it is useful because that avoids any uh, remnant of the vitreous. So always, even if you are sure that there is no vitreous, you can use that. Now, uh, this was the point which I was uh, emphasizing again. Don't use undiluted triamcinolone because many times we end up injecting more into the vitreous cavity and patient may have persistent post-operative IUP rise. So generally, we dilute it, say, 1 is to 2 or 1 is to 4. This is just to stain some vitreous so that you know where the vitreous is lying. So don't push too much of IVTA. Now, while doing cortex removal, you can use biomanual IA as well, which is simpler once you have cut all the vitreous. But if you are using vitrectomy probe itself, you have to be little careful because these have sharp edges. Another thing while removing cortex removal is that once you aspirate, don't lose the grip of the cortex. Otherwise, the cortex may drop down. So always keep the aspiration on once you have uh, you know, taken out the cortex from the uh, back. Using uh, vitrectomy probe as a you know aspirator, it's very important to be careful for while you know going near the anterior capsular margins because you might tear them. And if you tear the anterior capsular margin or you cause zonular dialysis, there might be a difficulty in putting IL in the sulcus. Now, one of the common things we come across because we reuse probes many times is the non-working of the probe. So always check that the vitreous probe is working before you start. If you find it's jammed, always avoid using such probe. And for your cases, it's better to use a new vitrectomy probe when you have a PC rupture because these jam probes cause more retinal problems than any other thing. Of course, you do not need anti-vitrectomy in all cases. So if the anti-hyaloid is intact, you can check that by just pushing in some OVD, you find that it doesn't go in the vitreous and just forms the bag. That means anterior is still intact and you can avoid anterior in these cases and just remove the cortex and put the IOL. So what is important is to not to, you know, get panic during this situation and calmly you can, uh, you know, manage all these situations very easily. From vitreoretinal perspective, I think a couple of things which are needed is don't fish around once the nucleus is dropping. Once it goes beyond antivitreous, I think don't fish around the nucleus because that may cause even giant retinal tears and cause very bad posterior complications. And even if you cannot manage that complication, it's best to suture all the incisions and just refer right away to a vitreoretinal colleague. I think that will take care of the patient much more than you trying to you know, uh, manage that situation yourself. So thank you so much. Those were a few of my tips. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patwarzan. Those were very excellent and very useful tips uh, uh, for the anterior segment surgeon. 
and you brought home the point that the chamber has to be very stable at all times and always do the vitrectomy through the side port and not through the main port. So very well brought out points. Any comments from the chairpersons? Anything that you would like to add? Very nice uh, presentation with so many case scenarios, so many cases that you showed. Excellent. And all the points are extremely valid. Uh, I would say that uh, Qatar, we as retina surgeons are uh, uh, very, very used to it when you said that, you know, mm -hmm. don't use it sometimes because it can rupture the PC. For us, it's not a sharp edge. We work near the retina, we segment membranes along the surface of the retina. But I would say it's a useful tool because uh, if you find vitreous and you are not having a cutter at that time, you are aspirating the cortex with a, a regular IA. Uh, and if there is vitreous, I think cutter is always a useful option because you switch on the cutter on mode and just uh, do it with the vitrectomy and mm -hmm. then you can aspirate in cutter off mode also. So right. then, uh, other than that, I would say, you know, the... The cutters which we use are like, you know, let's say 25 gauges 0.5 mm, 23 gauges 0.7 mm. So they have, they, they can easily go in through the side ports uh, which are made. But excellent tips, wonderful surgeries which we saw. Yeah. He was would, talking about the cutter which anterior segment surgeons have with their anterior segment machines. So I think that's good. Yeah, no, the, even the 23 gauge, he, he had 23 yeah. gauge. And the tip is, uh, you know, the tip was not sharp. So the tip is, uh, is reasonably okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, one point I want to make is that there are modes into uh, various cutting machines. If you go on, uh, first is uh, you put on the uh, fluid, second is IA, and third is cutting. So once you go on paddle two mode where it works as an IA, cutter you can use as an IA. The moment the vitreous comes, you go to paddle three, cut the vitreous and again switch on to uh, mode two where you can use this cutter as an IA. So you need not, this uh, cutter will work as a biomanual aspiration system rather than a vitrector. So you can use either, but you should know about your machine. And if you put the machine like Alcon machine, you have first uh, uh, as, uh, fluid, then you have uh, aspiration and then you have cutting. So if you go on to this mode, then your life will be very easy managing these cases. I would go one step further because when you're having this kind of a mode, you're always scared if you're trying to get more aspiration, you may suddenly go into the cutter mode. So better is if you have a machine which has a cutter on off mechanism. So when you have got yeah. a cutter off, then you mm -hmm. can go all the way down for aspiration without being fearing that there'll be any cutting happening. Um, now, uh, yeah, I, now with the newer machines like Alcons, they have a vitrectomy mode where you can shift from directly to cortex mode as uh, yeah. Dr. Vinay was saying. So you need not use the IA cut mode, but you can go to cortex mode and then again come back. I think that's the best. Yeah. But that's, that's uh, the most point. of the machine do not have uh, all the modes. So I think we have to make best of out of whatever we have. Other thing what I would say is that, you know, these things happen once in a while. And when, when a PC rent happens, your adrenaline levels are very high. You are already very tensed up. So it's always a good idea that you have mock drills in your OT, the way we have mock drills for a, a, code, a code blue or a CPR. So True. everyone should know what exactly to do at that time. And without any verbal signals, just by your sign signals, you, they, they can set up the vitrectomy machine for you because you don't want to be creating a scene in the OT at that time. So it is very important to be prepared in every case and have a dedicated place where all the equipments are present. So everyone can just in immediately set up a vitrectomy setup for you. So you have to have mock drills about this on a regular basis. Yeah. Since there is so yes, much uh, so uh, much of the retina surgeons also present here, I would just like to have uh, an open discussion or your, your, your comments on, <clears throat> because there are many people who believe that, you know, uh, going from behind uh, yeah. would, be, would be a better option, uh, you know, to avoid more and more vitreous coming out. Uh, you are you're actually pulling the vitreous into the vitreous cavity rather than cutting it uh, on a, on a parallel plane. So maybe one or two comments, you know, you know, from the yeah. VR surgeons. There are actually a few. Yeah, we segments. have an entire debate on this a bit thank later. You, thank you. I, I thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. We have an entire debate, so we'll discuss it at that point. And just a small practical tip about the use of TCA. If you want to avoid injecting more TCA and getting into problem. Just instruct your staff not to shake the vial before you draw your TCA. 
So what you will get is the super latent fluid, which will be just adequate to delineate the vitreous and not excess, which will go into the vitreous. Second thing is these, uh, Dr. Savarab did a very good job, but it is important to note that there are many situations where the anterior segment surgeon is doing anterior vitrectomy with the help of that fake, uh, anterior vitrectomy mode in the FACO machine. So there the cut rate won't be so high and it will be a less responsive machine. Third thing is if you are working near the eye rays in the cutting mode, then before you realize you would have eaten that iris. So you will have to be very careful when you are near the iris and or the uh, capsular margins, the excess margins. Thank you, sir. So we'll uh, now move on to the next talk. I'll be calling now Dr. Avnendra Gupta. Uh, he's a senior vitroretina consultant and the director of Nayan Jyoti Eye and Laser Center, Faridabad, and also a senior vitroretinal consultant at the Center for Sight, New Delhi. So he'll be giving us some innovative vitroretinal tips and tricks for complicated anterior segment situations. Over to you, Dr. Abhinav. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Thank you, Tinku, for having me here. Uh, these are some of the innovative techniques which I have developed along with my anterior segment surgeons. Uh, these are difficult situations uh, where they uh, need our help. So these are small, small uh, things which all anterior segment surgeon can practice. Uh, I have, uh, I'm putting here only two techniques because I have somewhere around eight or nine uh, anterior segment techniques. But because of the positive of time, I can't illustrate all of them. So this is my first uh, innovative technique when uh, there is a shallow anterior chamber and a positive uh, pressure. Then it's a nightmare for a FACO surgeon. The reason behind it, you have a lesser space in the anterior segment surgery, anterior segment to do perform a FACO emulsification surgery. So don't worry, we are here to make your life easy by a simple innovation. The indications are mature or hypermature cataract, phacomorphic glaucoma, cataract in angle closure glaucoma, hypermetropic eye, and nanophthalmic eye where anterior segment is pretty shallow. So uh, this is one Thing. This was a patient of uh, a phacomorphic glaucoma, came to us with uh, very high tension of 56, PR was inaccurate, patient was given injection mannitol and was on maximal anti-glaucoma steroids. You can see in hypermature, there is a posterior sinicare. So what we do is we put an trocar cannula system 4 millimeters behind the lens. And many times you can see because of the intraocular pressure, the outside pressure is zero. The pressure inside the eye is uh, pressure inside the eye is uh, uh, high, and the vitreous protrudes out. And we just do a toilet kind of a vitrectomy, and the intraocular pressure decreases. So uh, once the pressure is decreased, what we do is. We make a clear corneal tunnel. Uh, since the pressure from behind is less, the chances of extension of uh, rexes is pretty less. In hypermature cataract, we start with a small rexes and then gently enlarge this rexes. And you can see because we have made the tension low from behind, iris lens diaphragm has gone back we can achieve a good rexis, which is very difficult in these kind of cases. Once the rexis is made, you go for a direct chop, remove the nucleus, and all the pa parts of the nucleus is removed. Now you see, because the fluid has somewhere hydrated the vitreous cavity, you can see the IOP has increased again. The iris has come into the wound. So, the tensions are high, just go and remove the plug and do some more toilet kind of a vitrectomy. The vitreous and the fluid vitreous comes out from the uh, trocar cannula, uh, from the cannula and the intraocular pressure is reduced. Now you have a uh, concave posterior capsule rather than a convex posterior capsule. So if you have a concave uh, uh, posterior capsule, life becomes easier. You will not have a posterior capsular rent. Aspiration of cortex will become easier. And implantation of the lens will 
be much easier. Uh, since it's a phagomorphic glaucoma, I will like to put one or two sutures here. And in, at the last, you remove the trocar cannula system. You don't have to put a suture here. And this patient ended at with 6-9 vision, day one post-operative. You can see a pretty clear cornea with slight amount of air bubble. So advantages of this technique is and the chances of extension is decreased. There are less chances of desmond detachment. More space in AC for phaco emulsification. Decreased positive pressure, so the cortex aspiration is easier. The chances of posterior cap capsular rent is decreased. And there is a clear cornea postoperatively. This we have published in IGO limited vitrectomine phacomorphic glaucoma. Uh, this is another a technique where we use a chandelier illumination in hazy cornea. And we started doing it somewhere around 2012. And you can see there is a corneal opacity. What happens is if you do a phaco emulsification, you need a good red glow. Because of this corneal opacity, uh, the light diffracts from the corneal surface and you don't get a good red glow. Once the red glow is not good, the depth perception is not good and you can't make a good rexis and do a good phaco emulsification. So uh, what we do, we put a chandelier 25 gauge illumination and it's important that you ask your assistant to make this chandelier vertical so you will get a good red glow. After that, what you have to do, you have to put off the microscope light off. So this, what you are doing the procedure in darkness, you're not doing under microscope illumination. And you can see because you have bypassed this corneal opacity, you can see a good glow. Since the good glow is there, the depth perception is good. You can easily chop this uh, nucleus, which was a very difficult thing if you don't have a good glow and per uh, if you don't have a good uh, glow, so chandelier illumination gives you a good glow. Aspiration, cortex aspiration is also pretty easy in these cases. And then the lens is implanted in the last. So a difficult case, just by adding a small chandelier illumination, the life is made easier for an anterior segment surgeon. The only thing is you should get away from the thought block that you have to enter through the past planner. And that is the biggest thought block which NTA segment surgeons have. So to conclude, patients which were difficult to operate should be operated and rehabilitated because of two spe uh, speciality coming together. And that's our strength. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Abnendr. Those were some very handy tips and very innovative tips. So I would request the chairpersons to give their comments if they have any. And uh, if not, then we'll move on to the next talk. Yeah, just one to... just one comment, uh, Gupta, sir. Uh, in nanophthalmic eyes, which you mentioned as one of the indications uh, for, for these uh, decompression procedures, mm -hmm. I think the uh, entry should be slightly less uh, than four four millimeters because the anatomy itself is distorted, and uh, sometimes when you go in in a nanophthalmic eye with a with a cataract, with the view is very less. Then if you go four millimeter behind, you may actually go in through the peripheral retina. So we have had one or two issues like that. So what would be your uh, you know you know advice or comment uh, for that? Uh, actually, you can do an uh, A scan, and that will give you the idea of what is the uh, length of the eye. And usually what I find is non-ophthalmic and non-ophthalmic eye are not hypermetropic eye. These are either emetropic eye or myopic eyes. So if that is the situation, then four millimeters is a safe zone. But uh, if uh, uh, your axial length is small, then you can go with 3.5 millimeters. Now, this was a very, very interesting case is shown. Uh, just as uh, uh, another situation, in some cases, you may have a, a malignant glaucoma kind of situation where 
uh, you may have to do the procedure which we have been doing commonly in LVP now that IZHV, iridozonulo hyaloido vitrectomy so that uh, there is no reverse flow of the aqueous fluid and otherwise you'll have very shallow anterior chamber uh, even post-operatively. So th that's also something which uh, you may have to think of if there is a pre-existing uh, glaucoma or a malignant glaucoma patient. But otherwise, a very nice video shown. In, in Other than the chandelier which you showed, Dr. Ravnindra, uh, sometimes you can have the endo-eliminator uh, going through the side port itself and you switch off the microscope light with that also sometimes you have a better view but chandelier is also a very good option i saw the very good glow that you had shown you won't get that kind of glow with the endo eliminator but still an option in case of corneal opacity one uh, quick point is that uh, while doing with the chandelier illumination you have to ask your assistant to make it vertical uh, many times it becomes horizontal and then the shine comes into the lens then you won't get a very good blow. So the light should point towards the retina, not towards the lens. Okay. Excellent so, inputs, Dr. Gupta. Though I have a small little thing to say, I would not agree as a VR surgeon for the vitreous to flow out of your infusion cannula. I would rather go in with the cutter and do a vitrectomy rather than allowing the vitreous to get out on it own because <clears throat> it is sometimes fraught with dangerous complications in the post-op period. That's all. But otherwise, it's right. Thank you. I think the best would be to use a valve cannula so they don't even have to put a plug out there and go inside, do the vitrectomy and the cannula stays in place and no need to put an infusion line out there which I saw in the video because just need to either plug it or use a valve cannula, I think. Um, so the whole idea of thing... doing a vitrectomy is to decompress the eye, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I will not recommend a valve cannula in these kind of situations because going into the vitreous cavity with a mature cataract, uh, you will not be able to know where the uh, cutter is. So, and what is the situation in the posterior segment? So many times what we see while uh, uh, the tensions are high, you put on the cannula, slight amount of vitreous comes out and that is the amount of vitreous that you have to remove. You don't have to go for an excessive cutting because yeah, but, then yeah. the hypotony will come. But so, if it's a liquid vitreous, we are safe. But as Dr. Anand said, if it is not a liquid vitreous, I would not like the vitreous to be coming. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. See, these are elderly patients. You ha will have a uh, form plus a liquid vitreous. And uh, you remember 20-gauge vitrectomy, we used to cut uh, and then enter into the eye to prevent any kind of dialysis. Slight amount of fluid vitreous with the form vitreous comes. <laughs> and we have been doing uh, this procedure for pretty uh, eight, seven to eight years down the line. And uh, till date, we have not uh, had any complications in terms of retinal detachment or bleed in the vitreous cavity. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Avnind. With that, we move on to our next talk. And we have Dr. Prakash V.S. Uh, he's the medical director and head of the vitreous retina services at the Comtrust Charitable Trust Eye Hospital, Kozi Kode, Kerala. And he will be speaking to us about the inflamed eye after cataract surgery. So I think he'll be covering TAS and off inflammations. What do you, Dr. Yeah, good. Thank you, Dr. Tinku. And uh, thanks I have to um, ARC, Dr. Prashant, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, my talk is on inflamed eye after cataract surgery. Yeah, so normal day for a cataract surgeon is of a happy one where his patients are happy, the doctor is happy. But then one day this happens with the red eye. It is very important you remain calm, identify, never go into a denial mode. Always identify there is a, there is a problem. Identify, try to identify the cause by a careful clinical examination and a tailored workup of the patient and uh, try to uh, manage the problem. So, for post cataract surgery, inflammation is not um, very rare, 0.1 to 2% uh, in, in reported incidence. It can be acute when it can be either endophthalmitis, toxic anterior segment syndrome, anterior uveitis, or it can be lens induced uveitis or scleritis. It can happen late also when it can be a chronic endophthalmitis or an intraocular lens induced, or sometimes very commonly steroid withdrawal in these patients. So whenever the first and the most dreaded 
um, for any under segment surgeon is endophthalmitis and it's all red eye it's very important that you rule out this one condition so that you are safe your patient is safe so this is an inflammatory condition of the eye due to an infectious process either bacteria or fungi that enter in the eye during the perioperative period so when do you suspect endophthalmitis first post operative day very unlikely to be endophthalmitis but if a hypopion is present always think it could still be an endophthalmitis after the first day, it could be an appearance of a hypopion or a worsening of cells in the anterior chamber by two steps that you the day before you have seen, or a sudden appearance of the fibrin. The most common symptom is blurring of vision, but the most characteristic symptom is pain. But mind you, pain is only present in 75% of the patients, and 15% can even present without an hypopion. The commonest pitfall is waiting for vitreous. So, don't wait for the vitreous inflammation because endophthalmitis is one disease which if you treat quite early, you can have very good results. So, don't wait for vitreous inflammation to diagnose endophthalmitis. The most common organism, especially in India, is gram-negative, which are also the most common, uh, most dreaded organisms because of their fulminant pores. So, start uh, management with a careful workup and documentation of the clinical findings of the patient, including visual acuity. Documentation is very important. And VSCAN is one of the most important tools in um, evaluation of a patient with uh, endophthalmitis. But tell you, it should not be used for diagnosis of endophthalmitis. It should be based on your anti-segment examination and clinical examination. Mainly because an absence of vitreous cavity echoes does not rule out endophthalmitis because very early on you may not see vitreous echoes. And also in cases where you have gram-negative or streptococcal infection, you may have a liquefactive necrosis which will make the vitreous appear very clear in the early phase. So in a fulminant endophthalmitis, you might find the vitreous cavity clear. And the reverse also is true, that is worsening of echoes is not worsening of endophthalmitis because when you inject drugs, you, um, there can be drug particle drugs uh, which is kind of, um, accumulating in the vitreous cavity and also when the inflammation decreases, the vitreous tend to get more organized and you might see more echoes in the vitreous cavity. So the main aim of doing a B-scan is to detect coexisting pathologies like retinal detachment, which will totally change your management. Also, always look for any retained lens matter which can mimic um, endophthalmitis. And also, in severe cases, you, have to, you can identify panophthalmitis, like in this case, where you see the fluid in the suprachoroidal space. Management is always an emergency. The biggest, um, the most important thing to do is to get it tap as early as possible because identifying the organism is very important, both medical legally as well as you can prevent infections in future in your hospital. So a tap is very essential and you have to give intravitreal antibiotics as early as possible. The best sample is, of course, vitrectomy fluid, but that's available only when you do a vitrectomy. So you can go for a vitreous tap, which is usually possible in any setting. And mind you, don't tell this is a dry tap unless you uh, properly attempt a vitreous tap because you, you may have to pull the needle little in or out or move to one location where you get a liquefied vitreous so that you get a tap positive. And if everything fails, you can still go for AC tap. And uh, um, better not to do, uh, better not, um, rather than not doing any tap at all. And always do a direct plating in the OT itself and keep, remember to keep one specimen for um, in the deep freezer for PCR later in case your uh, culture, non protein microbiological uh, methods come negative for um, organisms. Intravitreal antibiotics decision depends on your clinical assessment, whether this is gram positive or negative. If you feel it's a gram positive, most of the time we go all go for a vancomycin with ceftacidim as the first line of um, uh, intravitreal antibiotic and always uh, give steroids if it is acute endophthalmitis and if you are clinically sure it is not a fungal endophthalmitis. If you suspect there's a high index of suspicion of um, gram negative or if it's very fulminant and ophthalmitis you can even consider giving imipenem or meropenem uh, to start with corneal infiltrates um, fulminant and ophthalmitis happening within three to four days all give the clue that it could be a gram negative organism and if you have a suspicion of fungus you can go for voriconazol intravitreal injection and clindamycin for anaerobic uh, uh, organisms if you suspect and uh, vitrectomy when to do in endophthalmitis is um, if it is a fulminant endophthalmitis better to go for early vitrectomy because the damage to the eye is more often done not by the organism but the toxins the endotoxins that are liberated especially gram-negative organisms so 
Intravitreal injection only addresses the organism, but it does not take care of the toxins. So you have to do a vitrectomy. And also it helps to remove all the vitreous ass opacities, assessment of retina, and also you will have a better yield of organism. So never hesitate to refer the patient to a vitreo retinal surgeon if you feel it is a very bad and ophthalmitis. The next most common um, um, Pathology that is uh, confused with uh, endophthalmitis is a toxic anterior segment syndrome, which is actually an inflammatory response to a non-infectious substance introduced into the eye during surgery. Many causes have been mentioned like eye oil contamination with heavy metals, BSS containing endotoxin, viscoelastic intracameral antibiotics that have been used, enzyme residues, even ATO residues in the, many of the packs, sterilized packs, and many times you don't identify a cause. Differentiating endophthalmitis from TAS is very important. TAS usually happens much earlier than endophthalmitis, usually 12 to 24 hours after the surgery. And pain is not very severe as compared to endophthalmitis in uh, TAS. And uh, the corneal edema is the most important. The limpus to limpus uniform corneal edema always point to in favor of a TAS rather than endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis you can have infiltrates, especially if you have gram-negative organisms. And the presence of fibrin, vitreous cells or hypopion is more in favor of an endophthalmitis. TAS management, definitely, even if you're sure, better to do a vitreous tap because uh, doing a vitreous tap is not going to do any harm. So you are safe medical legally. So do a vitreous tap, roll out endophthalmitis and mild TAS you can always manage with systemic and uh, topical steroids as well as NSAIDs, usually with good results. But severe TAS, whatever you do, they, you may end up with persistent corneal edema, dilated up pupil and uh, sometimes severe iris atrophy. The other common mimicker of endophthalmitis or inflamed eye is the recurrence of a pre-operative uveitis that was before and um, in, inadequate control of inflammation before the cataract surgery is the most uh, common cause. You should have a minimum three months of re remission in if there is a pre-existing uveitis before you take up for cataract surgery. Pre-operatively, always high steroids and uh, intraoperative virus man manipulations if you have done, then there is a high chance of it being a uveitis recurrence rather than an endophthalmitis. Also, keratic precipitates, broken cyanicase, small pigmented cells, fibrin all favor more towards of, more, more towards a recurrence of preoperative uveitis than an endophthalmitis. And you can restart the steroids, preferably in a parenteral route, IV, dexamethasone or prednisolone. Lens-induced uveitis can also present as an inflamed eye, can happen two weeks to one year after cataract surgery. And the nucleus matter, nuclear matter, many times it goes, uh, when they, especially when the patient is moving their head during surgery and all, it can go under the iris or into the vitreous cavity. And the nucleus has more tendency to cause uh, chronic inflammation rather than more than cortex. So the management involves a good indirect ophthalmoscopy. If you suspect nuclear matter, then always try to find the matter where it is. Do a gonioscopy, UBM or B-scan. And if you find, manage to find the uh, particle, then do a surgical removal and that will take care of the problem. Late onset um, endophthalmitis is again one more problem, mainly by the slow-growing organisms like um, P. acne, staph um, This cause low-grade inflammation, decreased vision is the most common symptom. The presence of uh, plaques in the posterior capsule is the giveaway sign. If it is present, you are almost sure it is P. acne. And the PCR will be required because these organisms usually don't grow in uh, culture. So you will have to do a PCR because these are low virulent organisms. And we can manage initially these cases with intravitreal vancomycin, but most of the time it will require IOL removal with vitrectomy to control the disease. And lens-related um, issues also can present as an uh, late uh, inflammation, mainly when you have put a single piece eye oil into the sulcus, um, it can touch on the iris and cause iris chaffing and a low-grade inflammation. And always beware of mimickers like masquerades, especially malignancies, lymphoma, and lens, lens matter whenever there is a lot of fluffy cortical matter in the anterior chamber, tramcinolone uh, that has been given during the surgery can also mimic an hypopion. Chronic retinal detachment that is present and which was missed before the cataract surgery and uh, retained BFCL, all this can mimic uh, a red eye. So to, to conclude, always whenever you face a red eye, think calmly, avoid denial, you always accept there is a problem. Explain to the patient, talk to the patient, and it's important to roll out endophthalmitis. And if you decide not to inject or not to do a tap, please document why 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 that decision was made, why you favored in favor of a uveitis rather than endophthalmitis. 
so it is very important uh, document the documentation part and even if you uh, have a high suspicion of being evaded, if you better err on the side of give, doing a tap and giving an intrauteral antibiotic it's not going to do any harm and in fulminant cases always refer to a vr surgeon for early vitrectomy thank you Thank you so much uh, for your talk, uh, Dr. Prakash. And I think the last point that you said about documentation is extremely important. So whenever we need um So the chairpersons, anything that you would like to... Dr. Anand, you're muted, sir. Dr. Dr. Vinay? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Garodia. First, I think Dr. Anand wanted to say something. The dictum should be oh, Dr. Dr. Anand in the favor of diagnosis. Uh, uh, am I not audible? Yeah, you're audible now. So we can hear you. <clears throat> the dictum should be to treat every inflammation persisting for say more than 48 to 72 hours and worsening as an infective endothermitis than TAS. TAS is a diagnosis of exclusion more than uh, a positive diagnosis but i entirely agree it was a go good presentation and in case it is late in presentation then of course you must be very careful in finding out if there is a nuclear fragment or any of your i will uh, have ticks causing the same that's a very nice presentation but i have one or two differences with the presentation one that Ultrasonography is important whenever you're suspecting uh, RD, but that is not an essential tool for diagnosis. So a person who doesn't have an ultrasound can still diagnose. So that is not something which is at the top of my diagnostic list, first of all. Second, you know, he said that in case of TAS, still you should take a TAP. I think there is no need of taking a TAP in a TAS because if, if, if you're thinking TAS and not giving antibiotic, then just going into the vitreous cavity just for the sampling is not a good enough idea because, you know, many times you get a dry TAP. And other thing, if you're not getting a tap in the first go, don't fiddle around too much inside the eye in trying to aspirate a sample by any means, because then you might cause a traction on the vitreous and cause more problems. So even if you get a dry tap, it is okay, rather than fiddling too much inside the eye and causing any traction and causing more damage to the eye. Because anyway, the antibiotic is given at the same time. By the time you get your culture reports, it's two days after that. So by that time, you have already given the antibiotic. So it is ideal to get a sample, but not getting a sample is not that big a deal compared to causing a damage to the eye. And a negative report doesn't mean there's no infection. So that's another thing you have to keep in mind. So you're in task to take a sample and find a negative report anyway doesn't help you anyway. So these are a few uh, suggestions that I'd have. I would entirely yes, agree, sir, I agree with, with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, agree with you. First point. Really what... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Prakash. Yeah. Yeah, first you, whatever you told was correct. Like B-scan is not diagnostic. That was exactly my point. B-scan, it's a clinical diagnosis. How you use B-scan is only to um, rule out other existing comorbidity. So it is not diagnostic. That's why exactly what I also told. There is no doubt about that. The second part is like vitreous tap. When you do with a 30 gauge needle, there is no risk of any vitreous incarceration or any, any other post-segment pathology because it's very important to get a tap because vitreous tap has a maximum yield. So at any cost, you should have a, a tap. That's what I feel. I would ask uh, Dr. Raja's opinion also, please. And that's, a, that, that's what I also wanted to reiterate what Dr. Prakash said. Uh, he probably meant that uh, ultrasound cannot rule out uh, endosthenia. That was the main point. So if the petreus is eco-free, doesn't mean that the patient may not have endos, especially when you are not having a good view because of anterior segment inflammation. But we have developed an inflammation score, uh, Dr. Das and others have developed. So there you give a uh, score weightage to even lead edema and the pain. If there is severe pain, lead edema, just uh, anterior segment inflammation after routine cataract surgery will not cause that. But uh, I would say there are some other indicators like vitreous cells. Even if you can see on slit lamp, if there are vitreous cells, that is a sure shot indication that the vitreous is involved and not just TAS. So you have to go in then. And nowadays, now we are hearing a lot of silicon oil induced problems among various retina surgeons. Um, and in many of these cases, uh, they saw that they could see the retina through the silicon oil. 
but there was vitreous uh, retinal hemorrhages there was vasculitis so these are also some of the very early signs of endophthalmitis so if you see a patient uh, of retinal hemorrhages uh, even though the patient had any one full cataract surgery there is some vasculitis there is some vitreous inflammation then it is an early sign of endophthalmitis and you must act immediately in this thank you so with that we'll move on to our next talk so we have dr sachin mahuli uh, he is the director of the netra darshan super speciality eye hospital at belgaum and he'll be talking to us on cataract surgery post retinal surgery so what are the problems and challenges in this scenario over to you dr mahuli hi good evening everyone thank you uh, tiku madam and uh... Prashant sir for giving me an opportunity to share my views on this topic. Uh, I'll be speaking on cataract surgery, post-retinal uh, surgery. This this proposes a unique challenge. Uh, my slides are moving. They're visible, I think, right? Yes. Yes, Sachin. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so this pro this particular situation you know, brings us in a difficult situation, including pre-operative -pre workups intraoperative problems and postoperative problems we'll discuss one by one what we have to look into and how to go about it so when we do a preoperative assessment it's very uh, you know uh, important to record the vision because we need to prognosticate how much vision is less due to the cataract and retinal pathology itself so pre surgery and post surgery visual acuity records are very important to prognosticate fundus assessment will be difficult in certain cases if they already developed dense cataract or if there is a emulsified silicon oil and especially in high myops when the visibility will be very less or if they have developed a posterior capsular uh, opacification or a plaque like thing post vitrectomy biometry is a bigger challenge uh, we'll come to that a little later silicon oil in the anterior chamber also will hinder the visibility of the retina and you know uh, management of the uh, cataract later on corneal scar especially in cases of trauma will uh, you know give a, a very erratic uh, astigmatism and it should be accounted for so coming to the biometry uh, silicon eye, silicon filled eyes you know optical biometry uh, is uh, very uh, you know uh, important and most of the biometers right now do have a silicon oil mode so we need to uh, use that silicon oil mode and we get a reasonably good um, near normal uh, you know iol power if this patient has already undergone a scleral buckle with the IU ball will be elongated, we should understand usually a, a two diopter myopic shift is expected in such cases. If there's a corneal scar related astigmatism, we have to uh, see what are the pre and post operative astigmatism uh, following the injury and post operatively how to manage the biometry. So uh, in silicon oil filled eyes, especially, you know, check pre and post operative refraction. Pre operative refraction is very important because if there's an anisometropia in the patients, you know, one eye being high myop and the other eye being normal, uh, measuring the axial length and coming to a proper uh, IOL power would be very, uh, you know, difficult. Comparing the biometry of the other eye also is important if the eye is, uh, you know, normal. So pre operative refraction will give us a lot of idea about what the patient had uh, before the surgery, vision, and after the surgery. Refractive surprises are very common post, uh, you know, RD surgery and silicon oil filled eye surgery, especially in high myops. <clears throat> Other special problems in such cases are we tend to get very leathery and hard cataracts. People will be small, there will be posterior sinicae sometimes, which has to be managed. Shallow anterior chamber is uh, very, uh, you know, common in cases with the silicon oil, especially MLC white silicon oil. And, you know, you, they, once you enter the AC, you will suddenly have a shallow anterior chamber. Or in high myos, you, you might end up in a very deep anterior chamber. Uh, catching a nucleus itself will become very difficult in uh, some cases. PC plaques are very common, especially uh, in oil filled eye. The PC becomes leathery and, you know, the plaques are common. And these plaques usually happen at the site of lens touch more commonly. Otherwise, also, even if there's no lens touch, PC plaques are common in a silicon oil filled eyes. So coming to the intraoperative problems, uh, as we all know, these peoples may not dilate quite well uh, if there's a aggressive postoperative inflammation or if the emulsified oil itself is causing an inflammation. So the iris could be stuck to the lens. So we might use uh, rings or hooks to dilate the pupil. The rexis may run away in intumescent cataract because the lens gets hydrated very commonly in uh, cases because of the weak zonules and you know uh, pre-existing PC dehiscence. All these can lead to intumescent cataract. So, Rexis runaway is very important. We should keep in mind, especially in the mature cataract. 
leathery cataracts are very difficult to remove chopping emulsification so you need to follow a particular technique wherein you do uh, multiple chops into small pieces so that your phaco energy used is less and you can uh, you know protect the endothelium frequently weak zonules post buckle and post vitrectomy are very common so uh, sometimes while doing ia or uh, irrigation aspiration or even while doing phaco emulsification you might notice a zonule a weak zonules in certain quadrants you should be aware of these conditions and manage accordingly by a ring or whatever possible at that situation Lens touches are usually documented by every vitreoretinal surgeon so that when the cataract happens, they, uh, it will give a very important, uh, uh, you know, PC dehiscence uh, clue to the entire segment surgeon to, so that they don't end up in a drop place in an oil field eye or a post vitrectomized eye. So this has to be documented by every retinal surgeon if there's a lens touch in, on table so that uh, managing later will be very easy and we can plan it. Hypotony is a very peculiar problem in some, some cases wherein a high myo post silicon oil removal, uh, the vitreous is not there, the globe is completely filled with uh, you know, the uh, saline. So in such cases, the hypotony is very common, getting the lens to the, to the probe and making a very good tunnel in such cases will be very difficult, you know, very challenging. And you also tend to get deep ACs uh, in certain cases of high myopia. So there is one more syndrome which we usually notice is the when when the so the fluid enters the posterior chamber and causes sudden shallowing of the AC. So these things have to be kept in mind uh, in such cases. So this is a case which I'll show a quick video. You know this was completely emulsified oil uh, presented uh, with the total emulsified oil in the entire chamber. Such cases you can just start off by doing a good wash. You should always remember when you are doing the wash, there is more oil which will be coming from the zonules. Basically, these oil bubbles come from the zonules. So, the, you should be aware that these things can happen intraoperatively again, despite of having a good AC wash and uh, managing. Always keep checking the intraocular pressure when you are doing AC wash because these are the cases wherein the fluid will enter from the zonules and behind the it goes to the, behind the uh, posterior chamber and sudden shallowing is known. So, other, other uh, you know, uh, uh, section and tunnel related issues which we'll find always is uh, because of the hypotony, you won't get a proper tunnel. So, you need to um, be, you uh, use a very sharp instrument, make two to three step tunnels with a sharp keratom. Don't hesitate. Do not hesitate if you want to suture if the, if the tunnel is not uh, <clears throat> watertight. Sorry. Sorry for the delay. Uh, uh, are my slides visible? I'm unable to see the slides. No, they're not. Right now, they're not. Maybe you can stop sharing and then start sharing once again. That will work. Ah, yes. So, um, that rexis related problem we'll discuss very quickly. Uh, you know, there's a poor glow in most of these cases. Uh, you may not get a good rexis in intumescent cataract. A very hydrated lens, uh, Argentine black sign is also very common. Fibrotic, uh, you know, uh, lens capsules are known. We need to use scissors and forceps in most of the cases. Always preferable to stain in uh, stain the capsule in most of your cases. So this is a case wherein uh, it was a total uh, intumescent cataract uh, following RD surgery and patient developed. Uh, you Your know, video is not visible. Sorry. Sorry. Your video is not visible. Yeah, is not, not visible. Yeah. Thank you. So this was a case uh, wherein it's intumescent cataract. We are staining the pupil. You can see the emulsified oil. Once uh, the blue and the oil is washed, suddenly you will see, uh, you know, the rexus gets... Very typical Argentinian flag with a small, small cut also and it keeps on extending very quickly. So fortunately, in this case, the lens was very soft and the rexis and the you know the it did not go posteriorly. So uh, what we did was just aspirate the new uh, lens uh, with the Figo probe and then put a viscoelastic, put a lens inside, and then you can uh, complete the rexis post the post. Uh, <coughs> Impressions also. So after doing this, you can see a PC plug there. Uh, what I usually prefer doing is once the oil is removed, uh, go and do a, a nice uh, cut on the PC plug so that the visual acuity. You can do it post operatively also with a air capsule autonomy, but I would usually prefer doing this once the oil is removed. 
So handling the nucleus is preferable to do a direct chop, as I told, a very leathery cataract. You know, you need to make multiple pieces and use limited rotation and manipulation has to be kept in mind because you don't know the uh, you know posterior uh, posterior uh, capsule how it behaves in most of these cases. Common to have an excessive uh, AC fluctuation in these cases. Your bottle height and your anti chamber should be very well maintained in most of these cases. Uh, this is what I was talking earlier, infusion deviation syndrome, like misdirection of the fluid is, can happen at any time of the um, surgery. If it goes through the zonules, so you can have start having flat AC and iris prolapse to your, through your tunnels. So managing PC plug, as I already showed in the video, you know, you can do a posterior capsular excess itself, or you can use a cutter to um, remove the plug post IOL insertion, or you can also do a post-operative yeah, capsulotomy. IOLs has been already discussed with this previous speaker. You need a larger optic, uh, you know, IOLs, uh, preferably, um, you know, uh, which can, uh, you know, help us see the retina postoperatively quite well. Postoperatively, these eyes are very prone for excessive inflammation, posterior sinicae. All these things have to be kept in mind. Uh, you know, we should uh, try to keep the pupil uh, mobile rather than put them on cycloplegic and if you have a sinicae later on. Cystoid macular edema is also a common uh, problem postoperatively in certain cases, especially if you have done a diabetic vitrectomy and other cases. Worst thing of PDR and macular edema in diabetic, which has already been discussed in the previous talks, I'll not go into that. So, just a take home message is you know, we should be hopeful, stay calm during surgery, trust your retina surgeon so that you are at peace. Whether, whether whatever happens, you should be able to man manage. And be prepared with most of the necessary equipment. It's very handy in such cases like your scissors, forceps, for the excess. Meticulous pre-operative planning is very, very important in such cases, especially with the biometry. Careful and steady intraoperative procedures are very important to understand and detect the situation in time so that you can manage them in time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mahuli. A very comprehensive and an excellently delivered talk. You've covered almost every aspect of uh, the surgery. surgery. Uh, so we'll move on quickly to the next talk since we're running short on time. And our next speaker is Dr. Garima Lakutia. Trained in uh, Narayan Netrale, she is now a senior vitro retina specialist at the Saroya Eye Hospital, Kota. A prolific VR surgeon, she will be speaking to us about the management of pseudophagic cystoid macular edema. Over to you, Dr. Garima. Thank you, Dr. I request all the speakers to kindly now stick to their time of eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ayos, ARC, and especially uh, Dr. Tengu for giving me this topic to speak. As if you ask a retina surgeon, no, I cannot move my slides. Yeah, you can see them, right? So if you ask a retina surgeon, Arima, then... Full, full screen. We can see yes. your... You are seeing the presenter view. You should go to the slideshow yeah. view. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. I'll stop sharing first. Yeah. Yeah, go to the full screen now. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes. Yes. Can you share? It's fine now. You can carry. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, are you able to see the presenter view or the slides? The yes. slide. We can share? see your slide. We can see the full yeah. slide. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, if you ask a retina surgeon to talk about pseudophagic CME, then uh, the presentation would conclude in one slide, and there would be happy ending. But from the perspective of a cataract surgeon. Uh, it is really important to discuss this topic because uh, it is still the most common cause of diminished vision post cataract surgery, whether it is eventful or non-eventful. Um, but you need not to worry because you're not alone. It's approximately 2% of the incidence of a beautiful cataract surgery where the patients develop pseudophagic CME. Uh, it can be confirmed by uh, a sit-amp examination where you see the loss of oval depletion and retinal thickening. Uh, intra-retinal parafoveal cysts may be observed and can be confirmed with the OCT, where you see uh, cysts in, in a nuclear layer along with some SRF. The confirmation can be done with uh, angiography, where parafoveal capillary leakage 
is seen in beginning and in late phases it in late phases it becomes petaloid pattern which is typical for uh, pseudophagic cme and you can see a hot disk as well the most important differential diagnosis becomes the diabetic macular edema but the presence of hard exudates and microaneurysms along with uh, disruption of ellipsoid zone and more deeper um, uh, layers showing cystic spaces Hi, can lead to the sorry. diagnosis this is sibility civilians you know the <laughs> prashant nahi nahi ye kaun se number pe hai tumhara abhi maine you are dr prashant नहीं 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 जल्दी होगा अभी तो आई थिंक नो यू आर नॉट दैट बिहाइंड ना डॉक्टर प्रशांत जी कैन हियर लाल है कोडलू है कोडलू है नहीं सारे मैं यू कैन हियर या आई कैन ओके ओके अच्छा अच्छा हां यू आर इनटू दैट डिबेटिंग पार्ट सो वो डीपर नहीं नहीं वो थोड़ा पहले है क्योंकि डायबिटिक मैक्रोडीमा व्हाइल दिस इज मोर टुवर्ड्स इनर लेयर इन सुडोफेकिक सीएमए and along with that srf the presence of erm also differentiates between these two as pcme won't so any uh, won't show any erm but not necessarily true the risk factors will be uh, the development of pseudophagic cme is influenced by pre existing systemic and ocular conditions as well as complications during surgery as we have already seen in previous presentations it is important to identify risk factors not only for the prophylaxis and treatment but also helps in anticipation and categorizing the patient in high risk condition so these are the ocular risk factors among these we have already uh, Actually, heard okay. about in our previous presentations like uveitis and dme others would be epidermal membrane vnt retinal vein occlusions and topical prostaglandin use in glaucoma patients the surgical risk factors would be uh, as listed the most most important would be retained lens fragments which gives to uh, incidence of 46% in some cases for pcme the prophylaxis includes topical uh, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and it has been proved in many studies that the eyes with eyes which are at risk we should start at two weeks before the uh, surgery and the eyes which are not at risk we can start at least 3 days prior to the surgery the first line treatment would be corticosteroids and topical nsaids either as monotherapy or combined but in many studies they have been it has been found that the combination therapy is much superior so what do nasids do they uh, selectively they competitively inhibit cyclooxygenase isoforms of cox1 and cox2 or these isoforms cox2 is the predominant isoform in retinal pigment epithelium and nepafenac and brofenac are among these uh, why are uh, nasids uh, termed better than steroids because they have good intraocular pressure control and stability and there is reduced risk of secondary infections along with additional analgesic effects but the disadvantage are also seen like they are toxic to cornea um, ranging from punctate epithelial erosions to corneal infiltrates or even melting which was more seen with generic diclofenac earlier along with that delayed delayed corneal epithelial healing is also seen so as we have seen the topical therapy gives you gradual cme control uh, over the period of 1 to 3 months so here comes the role of periocular or intravitreal glucocorticoids which give rapid resolution there's a picture showing uh, different sites of periocular injections here we mostly use subtilens space so uh, you can inject 1 ml of 40 mg of tramsulon acetonide in subtilens capsule this effects lasts between 4 to 8 weeks and it gives more sustained drug release than topical therapy but again there is a risk of raised intraocular tension in some cases it has warranted trabeculectomy or other surgical procedures to reduce the iop the another important factor is when it happens the raised intraocular tension happens it is difficult to remove all of the uh, pst that is posterior subtilens ivt uh, tramsulon so uh, we switch to intravitreal steroid injections which are better in term because um they are easily easier to remove via vitrectomy and lesser dose is also required so you inject 4 mg in 0.1 ml which is shown to reduce blood retinal break uh, barrier breakdown but the complications again with intravitreal steroids are uh, infectious or steroidal endo- endophthalmitis masked symptoms of endophthalmitis rare could be retinal detachments which is hemorrhage 
and uh, uh, there is there are reports that this is harmful if used after vitrectomy especially with iron peeling and again i am mentioning raised iop that is common for all steroids so with this we switch to controlled drug delivery intravitreal steroid implants out of these the commonest is uh, ozodex and another is retisert which is glucosinol acetonide implant which is again used in refractory cases associated with posterior uveitis it also has good results with supracrural incisions but again the risk of endophthalmitis and raised iop is still there in some amount there are many potential benefits of this medication as intravitreal therapy for cme including rapid edema resolution relatively longer duration of action and predictable dosing but risk of rise of iop is there so one should keep in mind that if your baseline iop is greater than 16 mm of mercury then the eye is at risk for post injection iop elevation then we come to surgical management when medical therapy is ineffective in resolving pseudophagic cme surgical intervention is often the next step surgery is mainly directed towards correcting complications like malpositioned intraocular lens and the laser for incarcerated vitreous tag and pars plena vitrectomy to lyse abnormal vitreous additions to the intraocular lens or removing dislocated nuclear fragments now i conclude here with the take home message it is essential to perform the correct pre operative evaluation of patients in order to classify them as normal or high risk cataract patients very operative use of topical nsaids in patients at increased risk of pcme especially in diabetes or previous pcme cases or with previous retinal vein occlusions at in prostaglandin use periocular or intravitreal steroids for rapid resolution weighing the risk so again i have come to this conclusion slide that pseudophagic cme the intravitreal steroids thank you so much Thank you, Garima. Thank you for that excellent talk. I think you've given some very practical pointers on managing CME. Ah, uh, so any comments from our panelists, Dr. Raja, Dr. Garoria, any comments or anything you'd like to add? Otherwise, we'll move on. Uh, it was a good presentation. I would say most uh, CME cases. After cataract surgery, a cataract surgeon should be able to manage because they they do go away. I don't expect them to go away in two weeks or ten days or three weeks. They take some time, you know, one to two months. Uh, but NSAIDs uh, they are the most common treatment and they do respond. If not, then we go on to the next steps. Okay. I would like to share want... my experience. Yes, sir. Please. i would like to share my experience about with the uh, supracoroidal steroid in these cases the post operative iop uh, spikes which we see with intravitreal steroids are avoided and similar results are obtained though it takes a little bit of training to uh, do the supracoroidal steroid but it is a better alternative in case you are afraid of the post op iop spikes thank you so our next speaker is dr satya karna He is the director of ophthalmology at the JP Hospital Noida, and he'll be speaking on poor vision in good fake pseudo fake os. How to prevent surprises, Doctor Satyakarn. Thank you. Um, I'll be sharing just six situations with everyone. I hope my slides are visible. Yes. Okay, so poor vision in good sort of hiccups preventing surprises. The first situation is a sixty-three-year-old lady who is a villager and she's never used glasses, and uh, we are not sure whether she recovered a good vision immediate post-op or not. But uh, she complained of non-recovery of vision in the left eye after the cataract surgery, and no records were available. her best corrected visual acuity was plus 2.5 spherical with minus 1.5 in the right eye which was uh, best corrected 6 by 12 and in the left eye it was plus 1 with minus 1 at 10 618 so the left eye was poorer than the unoperated right eye ocular movements uh, there seemed to be a left exophoria slit lamp showed right eye cataract and the left eye good sort of fakia clear cornea and the pc was clear the normal uh, intraocular pressures and fundus was normal in both the eyes 
So we went ahead and did an OCT scan. And as you can see, the RNFL in both the eyes is normal. The GCL in both the eyes is normal. That does not tell us anything. Then we did a macular scan and it also showed that the macular contour and thickness is normal. So this is the first situation which we uh, suspected amblyopia since we did not have any past definite history and no use of glasses in the past. Probably also along with a bit of strabismus. The second situation is an undetected optic neuropathy in a case of cataract. So it is always a good idea to teach all the uh, optometrists how to do a pupillary evaluation by the swinging flashlight test in this situation where you can see the left eye pupil dilating on the swinging flashlight test, which is basically a RAPD in the left eye, especially so because once they get the hang of doing an RAPD in all patients, they will never miss a RAPD in a cataract patient and they will document it on paper and you will be aware that patient has an optic neuropathy and may not get good vision. So you can do surgery with guarded visual prognosis, knowing this before surgery. The third situation I would like to talk about is a patient who is on anti-tubercular treatment with bilateral cataract. His complaints will be gradual, painless bilateral loss of vision over a few weeks to months. You have to suspect rithambutol related toxic optic neuropathy also along with the cataract. So a visual field is a must, a central or a centrosecal scotoma that is not explained by the cataract in the pattern deviation definitely suggests an ethambutol related toxic optic neuropathy and you have to discontinue ethambutol, wait for a couple of months and then operate the cataract. Otherwise, you will get a surprise post-operatively. The fourth is IOP spike related optic neuropathy. We all know that there are various methods to prevent IOP spikes in the post-op period. Preoperative diamox so that intraocular pressure is all right. Manitol in known glaucoma cases to keep the IOP normal. We have to clear the entire viscoelastic at the end of all the cataract surgery, including from under the lens, and give anti-glaucoma drugs to keep the IOP normal in complicated cases and glaucoma patients. Also, beware advanced glaucomatous cupping cases who can develop a macular wipeout post-cataract surgery. And silicon oil-related cases where recurrent IOP spikes can cause optic disc ischemia too. Fifth, of course, not so common, but uh, still important when a retrobulbar injection is given in a case of a mature cataract or a complicated case, an inadvertent injection into the optic nerve of the anesthetic can cause an optic neuropathy. Last, and uh, I would say maybe one of the rarest, a 61-year-old male complaining of painless loss of vision in the left eye 15 days earlier he had an uneventful cataract surgery two days prior to this loss of vision. He was a known case of uh, hypertension with blood pressure spike in the post-operative period as per his own history. But he had no other fever, cough, pain or jaw claudication or any other headaches. And he had been started on tab visalone and uh, with which was now tapering as vision loss had started improving somewhat, he said. In the other eye, he had an uneventful cataract surgery three weeks before his eye. And his best corrected vision in the right eye was 66N6, the left eye was 69N8. Slit lamp examination showed good pseudophagia. The fundus examination, as you can see in the left eye, shows disc edema with peripapillary hemorrhages. So this case scenario suggests uh, some kind of an ischemic event because it was painless and sudden onset. The visual field showed a left constriction of the visual fields and luckily his uh, fixation was spared. So he has 6-9. His right eye fields were almost normal. The OCT scan just confirmed the disc edema in the left eye. The RNFL is 183 microns there compared to 118 in the right eye. The macular scan was normal in both the eyes. So this situation is a post-cataract surgery AIVN, which is very rare unpredictable, but you should take care of all the vasculopathic risk factors in cataract patients before you take them up for cataract surgery to prevent this kind of situation, as also maintain the blood pressure during surgery and the intraocular pressure during and after surgery to prevent this. Thank you.
थैंक यू डॉक्टर सत्यकर्ण थैंक यू so uh, we are at the end of uh, the session here of, uh, now we will be having the hot debates now we have to add the spice to this program and some interesting uh, topics are there for hot debates so tinku over yeah so thank you dr prashant yes we do have some very interesting topics on which are very relevant to the anterior segment surgeon so the first topic is the management of vitreous loss during cataract surgery and this will be debated upon by two speakers dr rujuta machave who would be speaking of uh, vitrectomy through the limbal approach and dr samaresh shivastav who would be talking of vitrectomy through the pass plane approach so dr rujuta you go first dr rujuta is the director of the machave i hospital and she would be speaking on the limbal approach to management of pct thank you dr tinu Can you see my slides? Yes. You can change it to slideshow. Yes, yes. Thank you, ARC, for inviting me for this debate. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Praise to the Goddess Saraswati, the Goddess of Knowledge. Before we start, what is primum non nocere? First, do no harm. Any surgery or technique to become the Shahid Shah has to have falling points. advantages to the patient minimum learning curve less costly equipments needed stands the test of time minimum complications and easily reproducible so today i am going to debate in favor of management of vitreous loss during cataract surgery to limbal approach and at the end of the session i'll prove that this is the shensha so as we all know the posterior capsular rupture uh, how to recognize and go for antivitamy i'm just going to cover the salient features and important points because of want of time So the goals of anterior vitreotomy are to remove the vitreous from the anterior chamber and all the incisions to prevent intra-vitreotomy traction to allow stable eye implantation and the basic aim is not to salvage the sinking lens material that is for the VR surgeons. So never do sponge vitreotomy for preventing vitreotomy traction. The main point is lower the portal height. Why to reduce the overhydration of vitreous, which encourages further vitreous prolapse. the idea that vitreous will continue moving forwards causing traction on the retina when limbal approach is used is a misconception and if the following principles are followed meticulously it will be definitely i'll prove it to be a misconception so what are these uh, important points first the bad manual use of instruments in coaxial vitreotomy the infusion sleeve around the vitreous cutter used as to hydration of vitreous while simultaneously pulling it into the vitreous into the cutter the convection currents disperse vitreous away from the cutting port and into the ac in bimanual technique which most of us are following the vitreotomy cutter is entered through one side port and the irrigation cannula introduced through the second side port and placed in the ac directed towards the ac angle and not posteriorly this minimizes the vitreous traction the second important point is to have water tight incisions suture the leaky incisions the vitreous tends to move to the area of low pressure and the non water tight paracentesis bring forward the vitreous third important point is vitreotomy cutter is positioned well behind the posterior capsule and not at the iris plane with the aspiration port facing up if the vitreotomy cutter is placed anteriorly the vitreous moves from behind to the area of vitreous cutter thus it gets pulled causing the traction on retina set the vitreotomy cutter on cut eye mode with maximum cut rate allowed for the machine and the low acum this is to minimize traction on the retina also the vitreotomy cutter should maintain in the central position and not to be moved much peripherally to avoid stress on the vitreous base so this is a quick 20 second can you see the video no it's not playing yeah this is transmural dye injected and you can see bimanual technique with vitreous cutter going quite at a posterior plane compared to the irrigation cannula the irrigation cannula is on the anterior plane directed towards the ac angle you can see the aspiration port facing upwards and at quite a posterior area and in central position so what are the advantage of limbus appro limbal approach it has become a routine norm everybody has to accept that first thing is familiarity of majority of anterior segment surgeons and a short learning curve fear of invading less known territory is less and the use of tramsinone makes the procedure easy and confirmatory 
easy if the patient is under topical anesthesia. The same feature tummy cutter can be used for cortical aspiration just by changing the settings to eye cut. Easy access to the vitreous incarcerated in the incisions. No special VR instruments required, no extra incision, less handling of popular tissues. Reduces the risk of damage to peripheral retina at the hands of a novice anterior segment surgeon. No need of VR surgeon if there is no retained nuclear matter. And pass plana anterior vitreous risk Retinal tears, detachment, engagement of vitreous base with the instrument causing dialysis, giant retinal tear, prolapse of a knuckle of vitreous if MVR blood is used instead of trocar system, so on and so forth. And mind you, these cannot be handled by a regular anterior segment surgeon. So at the outset, which point I mentioned, for the surgery to become shensha, the answer to all is yes and only yes. So my worthy opponent shall put lots of videos, pile of evidences, international journals. I could have done all this. But want of time and my clear and pure heart did not allow this. Also, we ophthalmologists are smart enough to know the difference and accept the best. Hence, the limbal approach is unequivocal with the shahensha. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rujata. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rujuta. And uh, now we have Dr. Samaresh Srivastava to give us the other side of the coin. Dr. Samaresh is a phaco refractive surgeon at the Raghudeep Eye Hospital at uh, Ahmedabad and Jep. So over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bhavan Kohle. I'm, I hope I'm audible and the slides are visible. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tinku, for the kind introduction. And this is an interesting topic and it's always been interesting for the last decade that I've been talking about it. And somehow the excitement doesn't go away. So uh, I'm just going to start with the case. So this is a posterior polar cataract and it's something that all of us know can go south in any which time. Our choice if the patient can afford is to go ahead with the femtosecond uh, cataract surgery because it prevents any form of hydro maneuvers. Uh, the technique is called femtodelineation and it's been published and widely accepted. So we went ahead and did that in this patient's eye and the surgery went well. And we were implanting an IOL and noticed that sometimes, you know, there is an incompatibility for a tighter incision. This was a 24 diopter lens. And for some reason, the lens got stuck and the overriding of the uh, injector happened. Just to see what's happening, the IOL is stuck inside and uh, any effort to try to move the IOL never worked. So we had to enlarge the incision. But in trying to enlarge the incision, the IOL also dipped down. And at this point in time, we realized that we created a PCR because the capsule was deficient. And this is not an impossible scenario. It can happen due to many reasons. The problem is, what do you do when you land up in a situation like this with the IOL in the bag and there is a vitreous loss or there is a posterior capsule defect with a query vitreous loss? I think we need to understand that for our cataract surgeons the own, or any surgeons for that matter, the only constant is evolution and we need to learn and we need to adapt to get our techniques to be done right. Otherwise, we'll still stuck up in the extra capsular error and we will never really go up from that. So here I'm trying to convert that small PCR into a you know ragged PCR edge into a posterior capsular excess. But I soon realized that there is some vitreous disturbance. The first key takeaway message, whether limbal or pass plana, is to suture your main incision because you don't want any collapse of the anterior chamber and more vitreous prolapse. Now, my take on this was to do a pars plana vitrectomy. Uh, and I've been doing it for quite a few years now, is that I use a trocar cannula system, but even if you don't have a trocar, you don't really need to invest in one. You can just use an MVR knife and make an entry at the right depth. Uh, again, as you, as, as you saw, I'm just converting that PCR into a PCCC and I'm following it up with the pars plana vitrectomy under a triumphsinolone guidance. And what I wanted to notice is that vitreous body that had prolapsed anteriorly into the anterior chamber is now being sucked back into the posterior compartment, which is the natural compartment of the vitreous. So you're not dragging the vitreous body upwards, but cutting it right in its plane underneath the iris, underneath the posterior capsular axis, where you have a wider access and trying to clear up all that area. Even if you're not able to pull back a part of this, the important point is to bulletin off the anterior uh, prolapse vitreous from the posterior vitreous body, as you can see over here. And you have far more access using that. So you don't need to do a uh, pass plana infusion. If you notice, it's a bimanual vitrectomy where the irrigation is in my left hand using a bimanual irrigation aspiration cannula and the vitrector is in the right hand. And once I've removed the, once I've broken the connection between the anterior and the posterior vitreous bodies, the little bit vitreous that is lying anterior can always be taken off using the limbal approach if at all it stays behind. 
just to highlight this with an example so vitreous is not just a jelly but it's entwined fragments uh, all these slender fragments so if you pull the vitreous anteriorly you cause an upward drag on the vitreous body and that's a big problem because that can cause an enlargement of a pcr into an uncontrolled environment <laughs> On the other hand, if you use a Pastana approach, I mean, again, with the limbal approach, if you notice, there is so much of drag. You notice how the vitreous body jumps up and down. And obviously, what started as a small PCR is going to become an uncontrolled one. Sometimes you may not be able to place the lens inside the capsular bag because what, what was tiny is now big. And notice how, look, notice those fluctuations and flutters that are being born on the edges. Compare it to a Pastana vitrectomy, where you are pulling the vitreous back into its natural compartment like so, and it's pretty evident, and thereby you are more likely to prevent the further enlargement of a whatever compromise situation that you've created. And to show you the same thing in high-speed photography, notice how quiet the edges are. There's hardly any upward drag, there's hardly any movement of the vitreous body, and it's a significantly more tranquil environment. So going back to that patient over there, this is how we did visualize the eye. Now, if you notice, we've done a pars plana vitrectomy, and it's a really quiet anterior chamber, that's the area of the PCR that has been converted into a posterior capsular axis. And I'm just going to move ahead in the interest of time. When you put a lens inside, it's very important to visualize and be very confident that you're not going to either lose the lens in the posterior compartment or entangle the posterior uh, capsule, causing a further enlargement. And you can only do that if you're able to convert that ragged posterior capsule tear into a more circular, circular curvilinear sort of a rexus pattern. Again, the choice of lens plays an important role because if you have hydrophobic lenses, they are easy to maneuver as you can see over here over a hydrophilic lens, which may be sometimes very difficult because they're really fast to open up and very difficult to control. So once we have the lens inside its place, we further go ahead and make sure the rest of whatever little bit vitreous strands are there have been removed and close the eye. And I'll just show you the uh, needless to say suture the wound. So this is that same patient where things could have gone wrong in many which way, but notice the small posterior curvilinear capsular axis, which we were able to do only because we did a fast plan of vitrectomy. So more importantly, uh, the posterior, the anterior vitreous phase forms a scaffold for the IOL. So if you do an incomplete vitrectomy through a limbal approach, because you have very limited access, chances are you will not be able to clear the vitreous completely. So you can clear it up in the area of PCR and maybe a little bit here and there, but because you're movement is limited and because your approach is limited these vitreous bodies on the end, on either end when you put an IOL may cause a tilt or may prolapse later because it's still right there if you do a pass plan approach there's a far more movement maneuverability available because you're, you're not you're not going from top bottom but you're going from side to side and thereby chances of clearing not only the area of the PCR but furthermore is always possible so if you put a lens inside the eye you will have a symmetric scaffold but if the nucleus does drop, like Dr. Rajuta was saying, this is a past kind of vitrectomy is not to fetch out the nucleus, it's to just maintain the integrity. Please refer this patient to your retinal colleague because our point <coughs> is to say what it is to make sure. Also, once the surgery is done, please have the retina doctor look at the peripheral retina. If there's any breaks or any tears, they can always laser it off. So please change your mindset and you can adapt. You need to talk to your retina colleagues. Look at some videos. There's ample evidence available right now in our published data and a lot of surgical videos. Go and observe in certain senior surgeons' places and choose the path that's not only safe and predictable, but also good for patients' visual outcome because that's what we want to do as cataract surgeons. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samaresh. I think both the speakers very excellently defended, defended their viewpoints. Uh, so, Dr. Anand Pangarkar, sir, what are your final uh, uh, views on this topic? Your both final things, Yeah, both the things have their own merits. If you are strictly an anterior segment surgeon, not trained to do a parsmina, you may avoid. But remember that you are not doing a complete anterior vitrectomy. You are just removing the vitreous which has prolapsed. And therefore, it will be a, not a 1A situation, but result-wise, but it will be a 1B or 1C. So the Parsvena approach is the best. However, you need to get training. I will avoid limbal approach in these following patients. Myops and patients with history of trauma. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sai Kumar, any other comments or any other questions that you had? Is he here? Okay, so we move on to the next topic. The next topic is a scenario where you have a cataract with a full thickness macular hole. 
and uh, we have dr pallavi singh who's a vitra retina consultant at dr ramesh eye hospital ludhiana she'll be speaking on the stepped approach that is cataract followed by vitrectomy and we have dr aarti mohan kumar who's a vitra retina consultant at the rajan eye care hospital chennai who will be talking to us about a combined approach so dr pallavi singh good evening first. everyone am i audible yes uh uh, so thank you team arc dr prashant bhavan kule dr tinku bali for uh, giving me this opportunity so why i vehemently support going for a sequential surgery for uh, in cataract with macular hole as compared to combined fecovit we will see move this slide slides are not moving You can share your slides again. Yeah. So there are pre-operative considerations like taking care of cataract induced vision loss helps in better prognostication. and helps in giving more realistic goals after macular hole surgery getting uh, both the surgeons together uh, in the same or on the same day uh, needs a lot of coordination and which is very difficult to achieve in today's modern day practice two different surgical machines complicating surgical instrument management by the operating staff getting two different trained assistants so then there are intraoperative challenges dif difficulty in maintaining the anterior chamber depth and so there is repeated ac shallowing there is risk of pcrl subluxation or dislocation and in the cases of large capsulorexis gas bubble may end up pushing the il out of the capsular bag so in my opinion it is best to wait at least a month to allow the capsular bag to shrink wrap down to hold the lens firmly in place then there is compromised visualization for the vr surgeon because of the endothelial stri corneal edema iol decentration and pupil constriction especially in the heart cataracts which makes crucial steps like ilm peeling very difficult difficulty in peripheral vitreous shaving and eventual smaller gas fills so it's always better to allow the eye to heal for a couple of weeks then there are post operative considerations multiple wounds by the end of these combined cases so there is always a higher risk of hypotony higher risk of endophthalmitis and the need for suturing it has been seen that in combined cases there is a higher risk in a uh, higher rise in iop uh, more capsular block and tas so my opponent will surely argue that there is a quicker uh, visual rehabilitation in one surgery versus two surgery but for one surgery per se there is more injection and inflammation of the globe more endothelial damage affecting the cornea in a long run there is notable myopic shift in post operative refraction after combined phacovitrectomy surgeries for macular hole repair and that has been seen in multiple studies so my take home message is that a topical surgery followed by a 45 minute surgery a month later is better than a long combined surgery when the final outcome can be smooth and predictable my opponent will go on and on about avoiding the hassles of two surgeries saving time saving cost but i would just like to conclude that patient's optimal outcome shall be the prime focus of a surgeon one step at a time patient's is genius thank you thank you dr pallavi for that very concise talk and now we have dr aarti mohan kumar with her viewpoint Dr. Arti, yeah. uh, are my slides visible? Yes, yes. A very good evening to all. I thank Team ARC AIOS for giving me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So today, I am going to be putting my points in favor of why I will be going for a combined approach, which is a phaco vitrectomy. in patients with both cataract and macular hole so phaco vitrectomy carries a lot of advantages for both the patient and the surgeon so these operative advantages are for both the cataract and the retina surgeon 
So advantages during vitrectomy is definitely a better view of the retina when removing the le uh, cataractous lens. So macular hole surgery involves finer procedures like internal limiting membrane peeling and definitely a PVD induction, which may lead to small breaks in the periphery. So all these maneuvers can be done with ease with the lens out of the way. And again, there is a, uh, we can always do a thorough and a safe shaving of the vitreous base and a clear removal of the vitreous, which offers a better gas fill. So with better gas fill, there is a longer duration of tamponade and a better chances of hole closure. Also, we can do all these procedures without the anxiety of touching the lens, which will further worsen the patient's vision in the post-operative period. Again, like Dr. Sachin spoke before me, there are a lot of challenges in uh, doing phacomalsification in a vitrectomized eye, which is because of the unstable AC fluctuations in the AC depth, uh, PC dehiscence, occult PC tears, harder cataracts in vitrectomized eyes, zonular weakness, and the lens iris retropulsion syndrome, which is known to occur in vitrectomized eye. So phacoemulsification is definitely more challenging, requiring a more experienced surgeon when done as a second sitting. So all these surgical advantages also confers advantages to the patient. So in a single surgery, patient gets rehabilitated once and for all. So the progression of cataract in the post-operative period may negatively affect the patient's morale. And it might be difficult to convince the patient for a second surgery. And again, since it's getting done in a single sitting, it is more cost effective for the patient. And the post-operative period, though slightly prolonged when compared to an isolated surgery, offers the benefit of recovering from two surgeries at one shot. So why the hesitation? So first argument is the prolonged duration of surgery, but extra minutes during the same sitting is anyway more better than two separate procedures, in uh, which might be <coughs> not possible for patients who are quite anxious about the OR. And there is always the argument of increased inflammation and increased sinicae formation, anticipating it and tailoring the post-operative regimen according to uh, this might help us uh, combat this increased inflammation and also newer instrumentation, uh, smaller gauge vitrectors have reduced the incidence of this complication. Again, the argument that a refractive outcome, that myopic shift is noted in patients. So there are review articles which have shown that regardless of the sequence of surgery, these patients tend to have a myopic shift and it can be adjusted while selecting the IOL for the patients. So easier uh, phacoemulsification, easier vitrectomy and early patient recovery may makes phacovitrectomy the clear winner for patients with cataract and macular hole. Thank you. I think we are muted. You are muted. So now I invite Dr. Ramandeep Singh, who is a vitreretina professor at PGI Chandigarh to give his final comments. Dr. Amandeep. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, basically, the, there is uh, not enough evidence in the literature for on this topic, actually. So what is the best practice recommendation? So hence the debate. I think both the speakers have put their points very nicely. But in the end, uh, my take is it's the surgeon's choice in the end. Uh, it is the surgeon who should rely on their own judgment uh, of the perceived benefit and risk uh, for the patient in deciding uh, whether and when uh, the cataract surgery should be done uh, based on their clinical knowledge and experience. So it's a surgeon choice, actually. Yeah, that's my point. If I can just add, uh, Ramandeep, I, I totally agree with Ramandeep where there's nothing wrong on either side, but I must congratulate any cataract surgeon who has diagnosed a macular hole before doing the cataract surgery. Because now you are debating when to do what, rather than saying, oh my God, the vision did not improve, now what to do. So if you can diagnose macular role before cataract surgery, that's fantastic. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So the next debate we move on to is uh, between Dr. Nishant and Dr. Lefnutal Pradeep Kumar. So they're going to be debating whether anterior segment surgeons can give intravitreal injections or not. So first we have Dr. Nishant, who's the clinical director of the MNI Hospital uh, at Chennai. So over to you, Dr. Nishant. He Thank would you be so speaking. much, madam. Yeah. So he says yes, 
anterior segment surgeons can intravitreal antibiotics and not intravitreal antivegifs here because to quote professor tiwari he would say people are more keen on giving intravitreal antivegifs than to give intravitreal antibiotics when it comes to endophthalmitis so intravitreal antibiotics is definitely they must know how to do antivegif is a question we can discuss yes Let's listen thank to you. what he has to say. Thank you, thank you, Vinay sir, for uh, starting off with a good uh, point. So I will talk by saying, okay, let the judge can decide if I should inject or not, be it anti-VEGF or antibiotic. So I'll just show a small video first to show how my vitreal retinal surgeon told me how to inject an intravitreal. He said, measure three millimeter, retract the conjunctiva. And he told me, go sideways, go towards the center and inject and make sure you have no conjunctival vessels. Close the conjunctiva. Just check for the perception of light. And, oh, wait, sorry. I think that's me over there who had given this intravitreal. So after seeing this, the procedure-wise, in terms of next comes when to inject. We have, the one thing we should know is what are the conditions in which we should inject be it an NPDR, a DME, a vein occlusion. And as you said, rightfully said, end of the mitis, CME, CNVM, where you're going to do combined phaco and intravitreal surgery as a single step. And last but not the least, my favorite, if you have a VR surgeon who's there with you, and whenever actually they tell you to inject, you will be very sure that they have taken the right diagnosis. And I'm sure my opponent is going to tell me all these reasons why I should not inject. If I don't know that I can damage the capsule, if I don't know that I can put it in the suprachoroidal space, which can also call a retinal tear, if I don't know how to check for an IOP, or if I don't know that 3mm, 3.5 and 4mm are for a fakic, pseudo fakic and fakic. Well, I've just told you that I know all these are the reasons which you should not inject. And when I know all these reasons, then why should I not inject? We know that the complications are also a little high. You can see that the list of complications being almost a semi-blind procedure we might think that these are all the complications. But I'm sure that 50% of these complications can happen to anyone who ever injects, be it the vitro retinal surgeon or a medical retinal surgeon. But during our PG days, I'm sure when we started learning cataract, we all used to give retropulbar or peripulbar blocks and look at the amount of complication we could have caused by that time, not only for the eye, but even to the level of subdural injection and brain stem anesthesia. If we have overcome that, I'm sure that this is possible. And the next comes, if I can do this, then why not that? A simple procedure which has a limited number of steps. And you can see that if I'm able to do a phaco emulsification with two of my hands and two of my legs working at the same time, the number of steps which can also cause complication, if I have overcome that, I'm sure that injecting a 30 gauge needle is not going to be an issue. You have the advantages of no waiting time. You find out, you diagnose that a patient needs intravitreal instead of referring him, waiting for the vitreal retinal surgeon if you don't have. And the frequency of visits, if they have to come to the hospital for cataract surgery, then they have to leave and then they have to come back. So multiple times to the hospital and the operation theater is a cause and risk for infection. As all the speakers have discussed, the advantages of combined surgeries is there. Always have a comprehensive approach. What about the days before fellowship? My dad, as a VR surgeon, has done penetrating keratoplasties and whatnot. So we have subdivided ourselves by restricting not to go for other specialities. Technologies help where we have amazing OSOCTs. The photos can be sent to our VR surgeon. They can also decide. And we can also send the follow-up scans and then get their help whenever and if needed. The only thing is, I should know how to inject an intravitreal. So I will take my final pledge. I understand what my opponent is going to say. I would still accept and go ahead with Lieutenant Colonel Pradeep Kumar and say, yes, as an anterior segment surgeon, sir, I will not inject any more intravitreal. If you take the pledge and you promise me that no posterior segment surgeon will do any anterior segment surgeries like cataract and refractive surgeries ever. So I stay above the PC and you stay below the PC. If this is a mutual understanding which we can have, I agree that I will not inject any intravitreal. Thank you, ARC. Thank you, Dr. Nishant. And uh, now we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pradeep Kumar, who is strictly against this motion. So let's hear what he has to say. 
I hope you can see my slide. Thank you so much, ARC, for allowing me to present my work here. And give me a second. Yeah, first of all, a big credit to Dr. Nishan for bringing out this debate in full swing. And the question is here not about the skill of injecting. I very much am for the skill of injecting, but it is about knowing when and what to inject. So there's a difference between an anterior segment surgeon who does not want to be in touch with any retinal practice and a comprehensive ophthalmologist. What Dr. Nishan is talking of is as a comprehensive ophthalmologist who has been exposed to retina practice during training and is willing to evaluate retinal diseases in the prescribed pattern. While we have sometimes to deal with anterior segment surgeons who have had no exposure to retina practice during PG or fellowship, and they just try to emulate a visual memory based treatment where they see a particular kind of OCT without going into the detail that what could have led to this kind of disease, try to treat it. And that is the kind of anterior segment surgeon against whom I'm trying to speak, they should not. My personal journey has been seven years as a comprehensive ophthalmologist, where you can say per se that I was an anterior segment surgeon and all the cases which I treated with intravitreals were treated as per a prescribed format and we were under a retina colleague who was guiding us from a different city. Now I have been in this retina practice for about nine years and I have been guiding close to about 40 such comprehensive ophthalmologists in Indian <clears> Army. <throat> and that is where we say that one must know when and how to treat. So the issue occurs when complications occur. What happens then? You have post intravitreal and ophthalmitis, post intravitreal hypotony. Sometimes it does occur with a 22 or 23 gauge froga and a lens damage during injection, intralenticular injections, and a vitreous space avulsion causing retinal tears. So this kind of picture, where one of the referred cases we had, we found an intralenticular osmotic implant in a case of BRBO who had a vision of 6'6", had few cystic spaces on the OCT, someone decided to inject, and not only inject, they went into the lens. So this was not called for. And patient does not get the best when patient has to require multiple injections. Nowadays, when we have to give multiple injections, we ensure that we give a single trocar. I'll be demonstrating that technique and cause minimum amount of pain as well as minimum amount of entry into the vitreous. Most intravitreal hypotomy, very nice for Dr. Nishan to have checked PL after giving the injection, but many a time it is missed and people do end up with CRAOs, which we have to deal with. And an ill mannered AC tap sometimes lead to lenticular damage, which is the reality. Lastly, this video will keep going on. This is for benefit of few of our general ophthalmologist friends who are seeing. It's just a technique where with a single trocar entry, we are able to give multiple intravitreal injections. So what I am saying is that yes, intravitreal injections can be given by a comprehensive ophthalmologist and should be given by them because there's a huge availability issue of retina surgeons in far-flung areas where many of my military colleagues have to practice, where they have to treat diseases where I cannot be. But I'm absolutely against anterior segment surgeons who are trying to enter <clears throat> the retina practice without any training. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nishan, for that wonderful animation. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Very well defended. And uh, now I invite Dr. K.P. Kudlu to give his final comments. What does he feel? Dr. Kudlu is the medical director of the Prasad Netralek group of hospitals in Karnataka. And I would request him to give his final comments. So this is Dr. Kudlu here. So Dr. Vinay, what do you feel about this? No, I think... Uh... This differentiation is a good anterior segment versus a bad anterior segment surgeon. So a good anterior segment surgeon with good knowledge of retina can give. There's no big skill in giving intravitreal. But yeah, a person who doesn't have knowledge of uh, retina giving intravitreal is not a good idea. So it's not how to give, but rather when to give, which is more important, I think. That's the discussion we have. And the important thing is that uh, sometimes we as a retina surgeons find frustrating is 
a person developing endophthalmitis, he will send a patient for intravital antibiotic to us without giving intravital antibiotic and you're losing two or three days in that period. So I think that's that was coming from the So yes, uh, can you hear me? So yes, a well-trained anterior segment intra surgeon can always give an intravitreal. Yeah, please go. Something that is allowed to do, intravitreal antibiotics. So. Yeah, thank I you, Dr. Vinay. Can I say? Yes, yes, please. I, I, I see please, too much sir. of emphasis has been given on whether an anterior segment surgeon should be giving intravitreal antibiotics for any other injection. But it is not only about the technique of giving intravitreal. It is about being able to identify if there is an intra rise in IOP and how to the, how to follow the patient and how to deal with complications. That is what happened with Abhimanyu in the Mahabharata. He knew how to enter, but didn't know how to get out. So nowadays I tell my students that first learn the technique, but also learn about the complications, how to get out of them before you start doing it. But anyway, Nishant, you did well. And of course, the kernel is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. Much. Thank, Thank you. you, both of you. Excellent talks. And now we move on to the next debate, that is management of cataract in a small child, in a less than one-year-old child. And uh, this will be debated upon by Dr. Henef Kord Hillen, who would be talking on FACO aspiration is the right choice. Uh, Dr. Dhillan is an associate consultant uh, of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Shankar Netral HNI. So, uh, Dr. Dhillan, I invite you. Uh, just give me a second. I'll just share my screen. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes. They're visible. Uh, so I thank you, AOS and the ARC for giving me this opportunity. And we are discussing on, we're debating on FACO aspiration versus lensectomy in infants less than one year. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking in favor of FACO aspirations. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, being a pediatric ophthalmologist, none of us have a myopic approach. Then why being a comprehensive ophthalmologist or a retina surgeon, we need to have a myopic approach. We don't treat the child for just a cataract till the time he's three years or four years of old, we treat the child uh, for the next 80, 90 years to come, like how we all make our retirement plans and we do have long-term goals. So does the perfect balance really exist? Lensectomy comes with a lot of complications such as long-term aphakia. We are not able to rehabilitate the child with an IOL. So we end up giving aphakic glasses. Uh, aphakic glasses ha do have a higher incidence of strabismus, 74% compared to 67%. Uh, according to the infant aphakia glaucoma uh, treatment studies, also a higher incidence of glaucoma and retinal detachment. Multiple surgeries come with lensectomy, uh, basically meaning planning to uh, do uh, an SFIOL or an iris uh, claw lens later. And also there are non-compliance to contact lens use, uh, aphakia contact lens use. And obviously it is technically a little difficult to in comparison to lens aspiration, which is done by trained pediatric ophthalmologists. Oh, and it's a less aggressive procedure. Uh, the, it, we usually use a limbal approach and a clear corneal tunnel can be used to place a single piece hydrophobic IOLs, which are now very compatible in children, can be safely placed in children over six months of age who have normal biometry parameters. Primary IOL placement is routinely done in all infants who are greater than six months and who have an actual length of about 20 millimeters and who have a good corneal diameter of 10 millimeters and above. Even if you are not able to place a primary IOL in the first sitting, a 360 uh, degree rim is left and it is uh, very cumbersome 
less cumbersome for us to uh, implant a secondary IOL at a later sitting once the child is of school going age, say two and a half to three years of age. Uh, in com and uh, most studies have shown that with a good posterior, primary posterior capsular axis and an anterior vitrectomy, we are, uh, the visual axis of pacification rates are almost uh, less than 90%. With the newer techniques like optic capture and bag in the lens, which do not require an anterior vitrectomy, also without disturbing the anterior vitreous phase, we are able to uh, minimize the chances of visual access or pacification in these patients. Uh, it's They are very easy to learn techniques with a very short learning curve compared to plus planar lensectomy. It also avoids a lot of complications that come with SFIOL and iris claw lenses, especially SFIOL, which can be done only after reaching a certain age once the growth of the eyeball has stopped. So leaving the child aphakic for all these years comes with a lot of complications. Managing amblyopia in these cases is very, very <laughs> difficult. So what do we have? What does the literature say? Uh, tertiary center studies in across the world and in India, they do say that uh, the one of the causes of poor visual development and poor outcome of cataract surgery in children is the development of amblyopia. So when we do perform cataract surgeries in children, it is not just performing the surgery, it is also managing the amblyopia and managing the long-term visual outcomes in these children, which can be easily done by a pediatric trained ophthalmologist rather than a retinal surgeon who can for whom it's very easy to perform just a lensectomy but then the children are referred to us and it's very difficult to treat the aphakia later so better to make the child either pseudo or leave a sufficient capsular rim so that they can be rehabilitated with an iol uh, at a sooner time uh, also the incidence and risk factors of uh, retinal detachment after pe pediatric cataract surgery they have been studied and the risk of retinal detachment is almost 5.5% uh, with a lensectomy and compared to 3.2% with anterior vitrectomy and IOL placement initially uh, the surgical outcomes uh, with a primary intraocular lens implantation and with uh, bag in the lens technique and optic capture are very very favorable <clears throat> very easily the only the only certain situations that come along, like say persistent fetal vasculature, what do you do? Then again, we have conflicting views on the same. So if uh, if we do see the vessels on the posterior capsule with the with the little technical ease, uh, we are able to endocauterize them, perform a good posterior anterior uh, posterior primary posterior capsular axis, do a good anterior vitrectomy, and uh, place uh, an IOL in the same sitting in slightly older children. However, yes, uh, there are certain cases wherein we do need to perform lensectomies with the help of our posterior segment colleagues, wherein we do see vascularized stalks or we do see attraction on the retina. Those are the cases I feel that timely referral pre-operative referral to a posterior segment surgeon would be um, an intelligent choice to make. So let's just aspire and aspirate, always take the straighter route, let the pediatric ophthalmologist handle these cases with a plain lens aspiration, primary posterior capsular axis, with either an optic capture or a bag in the lens or an anterior vitrectomy, rather than going through a lensectomy and then multiple surgeries later on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dhillon. And uh, next, we have Dr. Abhishek Kothari, who's the director of the Pink City Eye uh, and Retina Center in Jaipur. And he'll be speaking on lensectomy for a pediatric cataract. Dr. Kothari. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And thank you, uh, ARC, for giving me this opportunity. And I'd like to thank Hina for you know making my talk easier. So uh, the one point that I think uh, was made in the previous debate also was that we are not against the pediatric ophthalmologist doing this surgery. We don't want to take it away from them. Only thing is we want to tell them the way to do it is the lensectomy rather than trying to do an aspiration, especially when the child is less than one year old. So we don't have any uh, arguments over children who are you know over two years uh, or, or more in age. So I'm going to talk about the benefits of lensectomy. Now, we all know pediatric cataract has certain unique challenges. The anatomy is different. You have a shallow ACU. Uh, the the uh, scleral rigidity is low. You have a, a trabecular meshwork that's not very well developed. Inflammation is quite uh, profound and prolonged in these cases. And whatever you do, there is proliferation of the uh, and Elshnik pearl formation in the pupillary zone causing a visual axis obscuration. Also, follow-up is not that easy in these small children. So again, coming back to the uh, you know first dictum of medicine is primum non nocio. So your technique should not do more harm than it does good. 
and these are the harms that can happen when you don't uh, you know clear off the anterior segment quite well you can have uh, capsular phimosis you can have the capsular iridor uh, capsular adhesions which make your visualization of the fundus very difficult even in good uh, surgeries where you have put an iol and you you uh, cleared uh, according to yourself you cleared quite well you have arsenic pearl formulation and visual uh, access obscuration so uh, you know the literature is uh, pretty clear as to what has to be done in younger children now let's talk about the issues the main issue is visual access opacification then comes the iridocapsular synechia the matter of fakia and il was discussed and i will tell you what uh, can be done and of course there are anatomical issues so the solution to these are remove all the causes in toto that can cause a visual access opacification limit the inflammation by you know limiting the kind of manipulation close to the iris also as far as il implantation in such small babies is concerned what power are you going to put is there any single formula that gives you reasonably accurate biometry especially in a small child and there are multiple literature which says that there is none and of course you have to use a sub surgical approach that is least affected by the anatomical issues so this is a small video of a uh, lensectomy being performed you don't need to always do a lensectomy by the pass plana route you can also do it through the limbal route with very small incisions and now uh, there are papers that you can do it uh, using 25 gauge instruments also the rexus is far more controlled everybody knows rexus is a big issue in these kids with a cutter the uh, rexus is far more controlled and uh, you can make it to whatever size you want to you can enlarge it in between your surgery as much as you want to and you can uh, you know really control the edge it does not run away you don't have to pull on these onules to uh, keep it uh, you know central also as far as the posterior capsule uh, capsule rexus is concerned you'll see in this particular case the reason i've chosen this video is that once you've removed the central capsule sometimes this is the kind of posterior uh, capsule that you get and in this kind of posterior capsular plaque it is fairly difficult to be able to uh, you know uh, perform a very good round uh, uh, rexus posterior rexus whereas with a cutter see the control you can actually go ahead and do and uh, make the posterior capsular opening to the extent that you want to you don't really need to uh, you know uh, sweat it out there if you think it is uh, smaller you can always enlarge it and at the same time you can clear the anterior vitreous also in uh, from the proximity so that you don't have these arsenic pearls uh, forming and obscuring your visual axis later with this you've managed to leave a sufficient amount of capsule which can you know enable an optic capture lens to be put once the child is about to use of age and if you use a 25 gauge instrument you don't need sutures so what uh, it does is you achieved your size of surgical objectives in a controlled fashion uh, we all know that you know sutures in kids have developed vascularization very fast you have avoided that uh, monitoring of fundus through an fak uh, eye is very very easy you can see ora to ora so if you have a retinal complication you will find it out very early and once the iol is not there and the uh, arsenic pearls and uh, all those things are not there the deposits on the iol are not there your visual access and your monitoring is very easy as far as the secondary iol placement is concerned if uh, lensectomy is done well with a capsular uh, uh, remnants you can always do that at about 2 and a half to 3 years when uh, you know the uh, when the child is a little older and your biometry becomes a little better so these were the objectives why we should i think do lensectomy and uh, uh, i mean and you can always if you're not comfortable doing through the pass plana you can always do it through the limbus and still have smaller incisions and a far more controlled procedure thank you yeah thank you dr kothari that was an excellent video that you showed there and uh, now to sum it all up we have dr manish tandan uh, dr manish is a pediatric retina specialist with a special interest in retinopathy of prematurity he is the director of the prayag retina center at prayagraj and uh, over to him to give his final comments dr manish Dr. Manish is not there. Okay, so now we move on to the next. So we'll move on to the. I think this. Um, it's. We'll move on to the next topic. Uh, it's intracameral antibiotics are a must during cataract surgery. 
So we have Dr. Rajesh Ganesuni, who's the director of the Sudarshini Eye Hospital, Guntur, and he would be saying a yes to this. So over to you, Dr. Rajesh. <clears throat> so opposing him is Dr. Madhu Kumar. Dr. Madhu Kumar is a senior consultant at the Sankara Eye Hospital Guntur and he would be going next. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, ARC, AOS ARC, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this debate. I'm Dr. Rajesh Ganesuri from Sudarshini Hospital Guntur. And the topic given to me today is to say yes to intra, uh, intracameral antibiotics during cataract surgery. As you know, the post-operative endophthalmitis is a rare but vision-threatening complication of cataract surgery. It has a high variable rate and there are risk factors such as the age, male gender, inappropriate to post-operative capsular rupture and other ocular uh, comorbidities. There are different routes of uh, uh, antibiotic administration to that. We know that the topical application, there is a subconjunctival uh, injection, the intracameral as well as the intravitreal uh, in injections. And intracameral injection has gained its popularity as prophylaxis Following an ESCR study in 2007 that demonstrated a five-fold decrease in post-operative endophthalmitis rates with uh, intracameral cefaroxim use. And uh, there are several studies in the literature uh, that show the benefits and risks of different prophylactic antibiotic routes and uh, intracameral antibiotics alone are as effective as combined intracameral and tropical approach, reducing the frequency and duration of the eye drops and improving the compliance. So uh, what we have uh, our hero is uh, intracameral moxifloxin right now that uh, everybody is using and, and a li little uh, uh, information about that is it is a concentration dependent uh, uh, action and the, the bactericidal killing via the selective bacterial topiosomerase uh, 2 and topiosomerase 4 inhibition. It's a fourth generation fluoroquinone and moxifloxin it has a different chemical structure and mechanism of action compared to the older generation of fluoroquinone and it's very effective. So intracameral uh, antibiotics, are, and uh, to be more specific, intracameral moxifloxin has a better gram-positive coverage. It's a better ocular penetration. It has a coverage for also coverage for gram and two as well as for atypical pathogens. And it has a relatively low MAC values for most of the endothelial measures causing ba uh, 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 bacterial pathogens. There are several studies uh, uh, showing that there's a proof of safety for the intracameral use of uh, 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 antibiotics and. Uh, and one study I would like to uh, uh, highlight is the study of efficacy of the intracameral moxifloxin uh, endophthalmitis uh, for endophthalmitis prophylaxis at, at Arvinda Hospital, wherein they have a sample size of about 15 lakh eyes, where, uh, and uh, of these, 7 lakh eyes have received intracameral moxifloxin, and the other 7 lakhs did not receive any, anything. And there is a, it has been shown that the, it showed a seven a four-fold decrease in post-operative endophthalmitis rate and three-fold decrease of post-operative endophthalmitis in uh, MSICS and a six-fold decrease in post-operative endophthalmitis in factor multiplication. And intracameral moxifloxin has also been found to improve the surgery uh, uh, outcomes of cataract surgery is complicated by PCR or by or with the penetrating keratoplasty. There are uh, certain complications that have been reported with intracameral use of antibiotics, but all these complications are due to the compounded po formulation where the eye drops were diluted with other solution to achieve the right concentration desired for the intracameral use. For, uh, however, there are no issues with the use of commercially available intracameral uh, formulations. And we have various uh, commercially av available formulations right, available in India. We have these Vigamox drops. Uh, 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 I have no financial interest, but I need to... Uh, 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 tell what are available right now for us. Uh, but uh, these Vigamos drugs have to be uh, diluted uh, to be used inside the eye. And uh, directly what we can use is the Oromox, which is uh, what we have been using uh, for a very long time, uh, for a, uh, quite some time now. And it's very effective. And we have this uh, Orpin, this Oromax and Forkwin can be directly uh, injected into the eye without any dilution. Uh, uh, dilution. In conclusion, this intracameral injection allows multiple benefits during cataract surgery, which is evidenced by uh, randomized uh, controlled trials and meta-analysis. Intracameral moxifloxin seems to be the most promising when comparing the post-operative endothelmis rate and reported side effects uh, uh, with the broad spectrum coverage. And simple one more step saves many eyes. 
So what it is very clear, uh, yes, intracameral antibiotics are a must during cataract surgery. Thank you very much. Are my slides visible? No, not yet, Madhu. No? No. Just. Now? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for this opportunity, Dr. Tinku and Dr. Prashant. So, yeah, I am against a stalwart who is a master doctor in this cataract surgeries and <clears throat> using the uh, the so-called preventive aspect for uh, cataract, uh, the uh, incidence of endosomatis in, during cataract, just not the intracameral, but he has a very well established protocols in his uh, hospital. So I will be speaking uh, against this notion that intracameral antibiotics are a must during the cataract surgery, at least not yet. So, <clears throat> yeah. Just by giving an intracameral antibiotic is the risk eliminated. So what are the risks that are there for the endosthalmatic stroke following a cataract surgery? What is well proven is the systemic factors, the surgeon's expertise and the technique, the sterilization unit in that particular hospital or the particular instruments used in that particular case, the complicated surgery, whether it has been handled well, whether, whether the tunnels have been secured with proper suturing, the preparation before surgery and the ocular factors. By giving an intracameral antibiotics, what are the factors that we are going to take care of? The direct access of the organisms, which could have taken, which could have gone inside the antechamber during the procedure, probably that is the only thing that is going to be taken care of by this intracameral mox. Uh, antibiotics, which have an half-life of few hours. Barring that, anything else, you need to be sure that you are taking care of these systemic factors. So what is must is a good pre op evaluation in terms of ocular examination and pick up these sinister uh, things, which can definitely lead to a, a devastating outcomes if not treated properly. A systemic evaluation like this just not treating this, but also covering these things before shifting them to the OR and to prevent the infection of subsequent patients that can happen. And proper placing of the drape so that the eyelashes are covered. So these are the smallest things which we all know and have been proven that they have a definitive role in preventing endosthalmitis. And also this I need not tell uh, for the cataract surgeons that <clears throat> a good tunnel is most important in preventing these things. This is one important aspect which many cataract surgeons rather might ignore when they have a PC rent or when they have some complication, even though the tunnel is holding well, a suture might prevent further post-operative hypotony or the access of the fluids into the eye. Now coming to the intracameral antibiotics, there have been several antibiotics which have been used. First, and this was widely used was vancomycin. The hemorrhagic occlusive or retinal vasculitis were well known and then it was stopped. And then came the cephaloxime where the macular edema was noted. And so it, it went off the passion. And now the new kid in the block is moxifloxin, where we have several retrospective uh, studies, but still date, there is no level one evidence. And the biggest problem with this is the compounding. The drug is not readily available for the injection and different formularies to different hospitals or different technicians may resort to dilute it in a different way unless a surgeon who is injecting it is in charge and is doing it it might be safe in hands of uh, like dr rajesh but what about the tier three cities where the, the surgeon is at the mercy of some uh, technician where he goes and operates and then they, they, there's a protocol that you have to inject moxifloxin are you sure what concentration of the drug is being given so FDA alert was issued in regarding this 
70% of the US surgeons were using this uh, intra uh, uh, cameral moxifloxin so they, there was an alert in this regard where it it it, it says that there is no adequate or well controlled studies and again as i mentioned the compounders the pharmacopeia or the healthcare professionals how they are reconstituting it or they using it in a uh, concentrated way or they diluting it there are several ways to use it some surgeons use it in a dilated way replace all the volume of anti chamber some of them at the end of the surgery use 0.1 cc so where is the uh, 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 a protocol to say like okay this is a concentration which is can be safely used and not to uh, not to ignore many drugs are available moxifloxacin is, avail is available in the form of eye drops even the preservative free by many companies does vigamox the safety of vigamox translate to the safety of other company manufactured thing because inactive ingredients in this can cause toxicity the only level 1 evidence so far we have is with powder and iodine i'm sure everyone will be using this so to conclude intracameral antibiotics is not the panacea but it needs a holistic approach to decrease the occurrence of endophthalmitis as of now there are no randomized controlled trials so i would say till the, uh, at least now it's not a must off label usage in fact in the literature if you see the vigamax eye drops or any other it mentions it is for the topical usage and not for injection into the eye and once the biggest problem right now i feel is the The, the the way it is used if you have a lesser concentration it will be either ineffective or it can lead to antibiotic resistance if you are using a higher concentration then you can have a toxicity last but not the least the surgeon should not feel that just we have just because we injected intracameral antibiotics the other infections even if we are missed out on the blepharitis or anything should be okay so that pseudo confidence should not be there thank you thank you dr madhu kumar excellently presented uh, dr anand pangarkar sir uh, i would request you to kindly give your uh, thoughts to sum up this topic uh, i i would compliment both the speakers but i i, I do agree with the uh, the person speaking against doctor uh, about routine use of intracameral antibiotics because nobody has touched the topic of uh, indiscriminate use of uh, antibiotics giving rise to Uh, antibiotic resistance so i feel that it cannot be a panacea for and a substitute for uh, avoiding all the necessary aseptic steps before cataract surgery but both of them spoke well good evidence from both the sides yeah very well spoken again so my compliments to and now we move on to the next talk uh, that is oct is a must before every cataract surgery Right. and we have dr shamik ambatkar who would be speaking uh, for and dr shishir vargis against the motion so dr shamik is the director of the shoreen advanced eye care and lasik center and uh, over to him yeah so very good evening to everyone uh at the outset i would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the arc and the organizers of the uh, tonight's webinar uh, dr tinku bali and dr uh, prashant bavan ko the chairman arc uh, i hope i'm audible yes we so can hear you i am going to speak in favor of the motion that yes uh, the oct of the macula is a must before uh, every cataract surgery and by the end of my talk i think my opponent will be left uh, wondering uh, whether he is defending the undefendable anyway so uh, um, we've all been trained to exact uh, a quality evaluation of every patient that comes in our opd list which includes taking a detailed history and then a step wise evaluation the protocol of which is so Uh, laboriously been taught to us and we continue to do it that it has now become a part of our genetics i believe and with the advent of technology we have some excellent investigative modalities that complement our detailed clinical examination oct is now one of the many tools at our disposal that easily adds value to our clinical examination so 
uh, all of us, uh, most of us have had the opportunity of being trained at excellent institutes under the patronage where they taught us meticulous examination, how to deal with patients, how to counsel them and how to do a comprehensive examination. Uh, the late uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Thomas has spent almost all his life trying, striving hard to uh, create a common sort of a platform of uh, or uh, creating a standard for residency training. But no matter how meticulous we might be and the nature of cataract uh, not allowing us a clear view to the retina, it's always human to err. And uh, just a slide about medical uh, jurisprudence, meaning the law of the land doesn't differentiate between and judgmental error and negligence. So uh, what's the harm in complementing a detailed clinical examination? Even if you are sure that the retina is normal, why not just do a additional ocular uh, uh, macular OCT just to be sure that you are not missing something? That gives us some standing if somebody is to pull us in a litigation. Coming to the academic part, uh, the OCT is, of course, a software-based imaging system. It's no more a fancy tool because it definitely overrides the disparity of acumen of judgment. Uh, it adds to the already good clinical information that we have generated by doing a, a meticulous clinical examination. And yeah. because it is objective, it definitely takes care of any subjective or uh, 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 human errors that can happen. Uh, it facilitates sharing information very lucidly. The, in, the information that is derived out of doing OCT is so lucid that one can easily explain. It helps in counseling and also prognosticating the case primarily, uh, much before we actually embark on to doing the surgery. And we can, of course, document all this. And of course, OCT is so easy to use and it's so quick. It, any uh, Even a semi-trained staff can possibly do that test for you. Uh, of course, in these type of cataracts, the ultrasound is a must. One must sound the eye and be sure that the retina is uh, proper. It gives us very good information. But for eyes with cataracts such as these, the OCT, I feel now is the benchmark for claiming that, yes, your retina is good, your macula is healthy, and the patient outcome after the surgery would be in our favor. And there, there are different studies and there are multiple studies that go on to say that, yes, the OCT definitely helps. Why? Because a fourth of consecutively evaluated preoperative cataract patients show some kind of macular disease. And believe me, most of the papers go on to say, like even this one, that a tenth of these patients would have missed the diagnosis of a macular disease if the OCT wouldn't have been done. Now, a tenth of those many number of patients is a big number. Why miss it? And the OCT obviates the missing subtle lesions, like what is shown over here. A shallow central serous retinopathy or a serous detachment or a, a macular traction, uh, vitreomacular traction syndrome, tiny macular holes, uh, uh, vascular uh, pathologies near the fovea, transparent ERMs, which are not visible through a dense cataract, vitreomacular skysis, wet AMD without heme and very early SRNVM, uh, early geographic atrophy. All these are maybe some kind of a hereditary macular disease uh, which was not ever picked and which is not very visible on clinical examination even with the best of 90 Ds because of the uh, grade of the cataract that the patient harbors. Not just that, the it also helps us in planning how we go about doing the surgery. Should we primarily take up the patient for a combined retinal surgery and cataract surgery or should we plan a retinal surgery later on? Or because of the new uh, uh, advanced lenses which are available, is the patient's retina good enough to handle the uh, constraints of a, uh, a press biopic correcting solution? So all these things are made very easy if we do a preoperative OCT on a routine basis. And nowadays, the biometers, the optical biometers come with swept source, optical coherence tomograms, which give you a small picture of the fovea as well. And one can easily compare those with the SDOCT pictures. They're so comparable, you can almost get a clear indication as to what the patient might be harboring, which could have ideally have been missed if we wouldn't have done kind of OCT that uh, uh, we should routinely do. 
so the oct is uh, can reveal retinal diseases that will otherwise be attributed to your surgery if you missed a problem everyone including the patient will assume that your surgery caused it no matter how much you explain it becomes very difficult phaco surgeons always discuss about refractive surprises but if they add a macula oct as a default in their diagnostic armamentarium they can sleep peacefully without worrying about a nightmarish visual surprise uh, post operatively as professor steve charles himself uh, a renowned and uh, a uh, uh, retinal surgeon himself uh, the phaco surgeons can definitely take care of the post operative refractive surprise by doing an ial exchange but can you do a macular exchange uh, the patient's expectations are running all very high and that's primarily because we claim the finesse of modern phaco machines and the advent of technologically superior advanced iols the last thing you want in your opd is an unhappy cataract patient because they are our biggest advertisers in of our ophthalmic practice so uh, oct at the end of uh, all the clinical examination wouldn't hurt the patient much because it gives such wealth of information that you can possibly prognosticate and make it uh, 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 make it easy for everybody post operatively so i thank you for your patient hearing thank you dr shamik and now uh, opposed to this motion we have dr shishir vargis so he would be speaking on uh, the topic that oct is not needed in every cataract patient and uh, dr shamik is a consultant with retina surgeon at the amita i k hospital in uh, kerala so over to you dr Sh shishir thank you uh, aivs arc and dr tinku and dr prashant for this opportunity so the next 3 minutes i'll be spending some time trying to explain to the panel and the audience as to why an oct is not a must before every uh, cataract surgery so no conflicts of interest or no financial interest so we tend to become complacent when you have something extra in your armamentarium so no oct is not a substitute for a good clinical examination which dr shami anyway mentioned in his first few initial slides so you need to do a good 90d good 78d and then an indirect and pick up if you feel anything there's something at the macula then you go ahead and do an oct if required but if you have a normal retina which you can anyway see with a mild to moderate opacity i don't feel an oct is really required so what about this no view to fund us no help from the oct oct is not going to help you here you hard cataracts mature cataracts mogangnians there you'll have to anyway rely on your macular function tests like plpr and you need to do a b scan to see whether the retina is really on or not so when you have a high patient flow especially in the peripheral and outreach centers secondary centers or even primary centers where they do cam surgeries are you going to really sit and do they really have an oct to sit and do for each and every patient there anyway you'll have to do your clinical exam do a fun uh, 90d or a, you know indirect and catch anything and if required then you can go ahead and do the oct so again here oct not a must for every patients who are going to undergo cataract surgery so oct won't help predict exact visual outcome rather you can use a retinal acuity meter or a potential acuity meter which we have been using at our center regularly for the past uh, 20 years so the retinal equity meter is a device which allows for predictions of post operative visual equity and gives useful realistic expectations prior to cataract surgery so this is a small device costing less than around uh, 50000 no financial interest again it's, it's got multiple small pinholes which allows the patient or the cataract patient to view through a clear area and then this is how you use it and around a 40 centimeter distance you can use this device and the patient will read and then this this will predict and exactly tell you how much the visual equity is going to improve. So an example of a patient with a normal fundus. So here the key has a NS3 cataract, vision improving only to 612 preoperatively, but the RAM is 20 by 30. A RAM 20 by 30 means that I can confidently tell the patient that his vision is going to improve beyond 69. So as you can see, post-op, his vision in both eyes is 66 after bilateral cataract surgery. OCT done later, normal. Fund, the macula is absolutely normal. Example of another patient, pre-cataract pre surgery's OCT was done and you can see there is some macular lesion. But what will, I, what will this OCT tell me? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think after cataract surgery, you'll have to, I mean, you know, we don't know how much your vision will come. So we got a RAM done and this RAM is showing 20 by 30 and I can confidently tell the patient, go ahead and do the surgery and your vision will improve to 6.9 and it has improved to 6.9 in the right eye. 
So another patient presenting with dry AMD. So you can see both the OCTs here. You know, it's one has a loss of contour with ERM. The other one has a drusen. I don't know how much the vision is going to improve post cataract surgery. This OCT is not going to tell me that. So I do a RAM. So in the right eye, it's only 6 by 60. With the RAM, it's 20 by 100. So that means after cataract, her vision is going to improve to only maximum. It will remain at 660 or it will improve to 636. Whereas surprisingly, in the left eye, her RAM is 20 by 50. And I can confidently tell her, in your left eye, your vision is going to improve to more than beyond 618. You do the left eye first, and then we can plan your right eye later, as the vision will improve significantly in the left eye. So RAM and the PAM, they have a more numerical advantage of telling the patient how much your vision will improve rather than an OCT. If I do an OCT, oh, I'm sorry, uh, cataract surgery will do, but vision it will be under guarded visual prognosis. So this is another instrument which we use, which is the PAM. So we tend to become complacent. Most of the cataract surgeons, they get only a line scan through the OCT. You look at a line scan, oh, macula is absolutely fine. You'll get good vision. But later when post-operative surprises come, you see that the lesion was somewhere else and it has been missed because you have not gone to your machine and checked those uh, line scans. So I feel for poor patients or even, you know, middle class, sometimes it's an unnecessary load on the patient's pocket or wallet going and doing an OCT unnecessarily for even a normal fundus. So you have to really see whether OCT is really a want or do you really require it? If there is a macular pathology, you then only I feel it is required. You can go ahead and do the OCT. Otherwise, you if you do your RAM or your PAM and a good clinical exam 90D, I don't think mm -hmm. an OCT is required for every single uh, patient. With this, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shishir. Uh, so I think both Dr. Shamik and Dr. Shishir have very convincingly presented their side of the coin. And if Dr. Vinay Garodia is there, I would like him to finally sum up this topic. Dr. Garodia, are you there? Okay. So I think that was one of the last debates. And yes, um, uh, there are situations where OCT is very imperative and there are situations where you know the patient has a normal fundus with a good clinical examination. And those are the cases where you do not have to do an OCT every time. So both the speakers brought their points out very well. So with that, we've come to the end of this CME, which dealt with all the posterior segment challenges for the anterior segment surgeons. I hope it has been a great learning experience for everyone who logged in. And I thank all the chairpersons, the speakers, the moderators, the audience who joined in for their presence here tonight. Well, we have uh, stretched it out. We have exceeded the time limit, but then uh, there was so much to cover. And this is going to be a repository for posterity. It's going to be there on all the YouTube channels. So anyone who has missed a few of the talks can log in at any time and have a look at the topic of their interest. And um, uh, before we conclude, apart from a special thank you yet again to all the speakers who are with us here till the end, uh, I would request Tushar. Tushar, are you there? Tushar? No, I don't think Tushar is there. Okay, so uh, from now onwards, we also have Dr. Prashant has designed a certificate for all the presenters. Uh, we wanted to have the presentation right here after the talks, but I think the uh, person concerned is not here right now. So the certificate will be mailed to you all. It will be in your mailbox in a day or two. And uh, once again, thank you everyone for your presence here, for all your excellent talks, the excellent inputs. And... Uh, uh, look forward to having you all again at some other CM which we organize next. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Dr. Prashant Bhavan Kule. Thanks to Dr. Harbans Lal, the president of AIOS, whose idea this uh, series of CME has been. And uh, good night and thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you so much.